I am Fatma Shamsi, Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, of Administrative Affairs in the Sorbonne University Abu Dhabi. I would like to welcome you to the second day of our special meeting to discuss some of the most important issues related to education that are affecting our educational and learning process all around the world. This session will be focusing on the internationalization of education. And uh, no doubt that education today became international, especially the high education. Some of the indicators that show that are the increasing number of, uh, of learners who are trying to achieve high education degrees and focusing on international universities. So another indicator is the increasing number of students, researchers, and teachers who are traveling the world and shifting from one place to another. And another also indicator is the increasing use of technology in learning. All of this causes us to ask the question, are we really benefiting of the international aspect of uh, education and how? Are the universities, international universities degree, affecting the education of our students positively, especially the generation that will be in charge of the development process in the future. All of these questions will be tackled in this session uh, in which we have uh, a group of researchers and specialists in the education. And we will try throughout this session to tackle the following subjects. We will start with Professor Jason Lane. He will be talking to us. He'll be, he will be talking to us through Skype. We know, uh, of course, the difference in time. Um, here in New York, we'll start with him. We will talk to us. Then we will continue with our panels who are gathered here with us today. So Professor Jason Lane is Assistant Professor, School of Education, University at Albany, the State University of New York, United States of America. the very long uh, uh, research background. Let us welcome uh, Professor J Jason Lane. Uh, he's going to speak for 25 minutes, and then we will give the floor to the, the second, okay. the two speakers. Great, thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and Welcome. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you from New York City. I wish I was able to join you live. Unfortunately, I had some family issues that included that, but um, it sounds like the conference is going very well, and I look forward to talking to you a bit about the local impact of international branch campuses. The, the work I'm going to talk to you from comes from the work of a larger team, which, which we call the Cross-Border Education Research Team, or we affectionately refer to as Seabird. Uh, it's led by myself and my colleague Kevin Kinzer. It was founded about four years ago with a mission to truly understand what's happening in this global phenomenon of cross border education, particularly with an interest in international branch campuses. Over the past four years, we've, we've worked with about 10 graduate assistants. Uh, we've surveyed more than 80 international branch campuses. There are about 200 altogether. Uh, but more than that, we've actually visited about 50 branch campuses in 15 countries. And I, I just want to know that this all started uh, more I did in Fulbright in the United Arab Emirates, where I was hosted by Michigan State Dubai in Dubai International Academic like in City. So speaking to you today is very near and dear to my heart, and the work that you're doing, I think, is critically important. Of course, 
the, the GCC region has become a important catalyst in terms of the development of international branch campuses. Uh, uh, the uh, the Sabon and Abu Dhabi and Mayu and Abu Dhabi and of course the many campuses we have in Dubai International Academic City. But I want to place that in context of the global phenomenon. The first known branch campus, at least the one that we can figure out to be the oldest, was uh, Parsons Fashion School, which ended up going into Paris in the 1920s. It was a New York City-based uh, art and design institute that was interested in fashion, but knew that New York was not within the fashion hub Paris was. And they thought it was important that their curriculum would be offered in the fashion hub. And so they set up shop overseas, uh, offering courses of local to students in Paris who are interested in fashion, but also provide an opportunity for their students in New York City to put it, go abroad to Paris to learn. About three decades later, Johns Hopkins opened a branch campus in Italy, uh, moving from uh, Baltimore to Paris uh, to uh, to Bologna uh, in, in Europe. And the idea was at the time, it was after World, World War II, and Johns Hopkins would have one of the leading international relations programs that wanted to help Europe redevelop itself and build those connections by providing a, a program that allowed leaders from across Europe to come together and uh, work with each other and network and hopefully uh, foster dialogue in the post-World War II era. Uh, they ended up then opening a campus in uh, Nanjing later on in China. About the same time, Florida State and uh, the United States headed to Panama. Uh, it wasn't considered technically a branch campus, though it would, uh, because the Panama Canal Zone wasn't transferred to Panama until 1999, but operated in a very similar way uh, and served the citizens of Panama and has really become an integral part of the Panamanian education system, even though it is a U.S.-owned uh, institution. I like to joke, of course, in the U.S., we need to be careful that we don't export everything that we uh, uh, that we have in the U.S. higher ed system. Today, of course, there is uh, Georgia Tech University, which is located in Lorraine, France. They have an amazing uh, research facility where they're developing uh, state-of-the-art research and scientists for Europe. Uh, we you know Education City, which is over in Qatar nearby. Uh, Carnegie Mellon has a, a campus in Portugal. NYU is opening itself in Shanghai in addition to the one near where you are. Um, but it's not just a U.S. phenomenon in terms of, uh, or even a Western phenomenon, but we have a, a large number of uh, countries exporting branch campuses around the world. One of my favorites is the University of Nottingham out of the U.K., which has a branch, well, this is the main campus in, uh, in Nottingham, United Kingdom. This is the campus they have in China, and here's the campus they have in Malaysia. I love uh, these pictures because it shows that they have captured that iconic Nottingham clock tower as a way to symbolize uh, who they are geographically dispersed around the world. But we also have Curtin University in Australia operating on the island of Sarawak uh, near Malaysia. Monash has a campus in Australia. Uh, this is the Royal College of Surgeons of, uh, out of Ireland, and they have this is their campus in Bahrain. The way we define international branch campus um, is that it's an entity that is owned at least in part by a foreign education provider. It's operated in the name of a foreign education provider and engages in at least some face-to-face -face teaching, so not online, uh, not, or at least not entirely online. It provides access to an entire academic program that leads to a credential that's awarded by the foreign education provider. And the biggest aspect here is really this physical presence, the idea that there is a physical place in a foreign country where students can enroll in classes, can be taught by professors, uh, and then ultimately it leads to a degree that's offered in the name of the foreign education provider. And the interest of branch campuses ramped up really in the last five years, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the, the number of branches has, has uh, increased dramatically. Now, it's important to say that in the context of private higher education, branch campuses remain overall and globally small, but in certain countries they have become a critical mass, certainly in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, where they are among the, the largest number of providers of, uh, of higher education, uh, Qatar is very similar. But 1995, we knew of about 15. These entities weren't tracked really until the early 2000s when the OBHE, uh, Observatory for Borderless Higher Education, began tracking them, and then um, my group began tracking them more readily uh, about five years ago. 2006, we saw about 82 that we knew to be in existence. By 2012, um, there were 182. So you can see the numbers are increasing pretty rapidly. Uh, there are 13 countries that both import and export uh, branch campuses. That is, they both sort of send their campuses abroad, but they also 
uh, bring campuses in from other countries, and institutions truly are, are flowing in all directions. This is not a U.S. outward phenomenon. This is not a north-south phenomenon or a west-east phenomenon. Uh, that we do see campuses all over the world um, opening up from, from a variety of, of places. This map is about a year old when the process of updating, and actually two years old, I think, but it still gives you a sense of where branches are and where home campuses are. So the blue buttons you see here are the home campuses. The red, bu the red buttons you see are the branch campuses. You can see a critical mass of export occurring in the United States, uh, in Europe, and in Australia. An interesting phenomenon, if you look, is India has actually become one of the leading exporters of higher education uh, via the branch campus model. And if you look uh, in terms of the receiving countries, you can see a few spread across the Americas, a, a very large contingent in Europe, which has to do with sort of the historic expansion when branch campuses were first developed in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, many of them went into uh, the European countries. You can see in China as well, uh, down in Malaysia, but also, to give you a close-up, um, the Middle East, which is not fully represented here because there's such a high concentration of the number of branch campuses. So th these numbers are fluid because, as you can imagine, trying to track this phenomenon is difficult on a global scale. They uh, change almost daily if new campuses open and old ones uh, or existing ones might close. And there is no reporting structure. We keep track of this via media reports, our own travels abroad, interacting with individuals, and increasingly people letting us know when they know a branch campus is occurring. But the UAE, we think, has about 40 um, branch campuses overall across all of the Emirates. Qatar, around 11, and they've been expanding. They just had a University College London. Uh, Bahrain, three. Uh, Kuwait, one. And, and Yemen, one. I'll break out the UAE number a little bit. Uh, because five of the Emirates actually are uh, importing branch campuses. Abu Dhabi, the last camp we had was five. Uh, and again, things may have changed on the ground, so those locally will be able to say better. Uh, Ajman had one, and the last time I was in Ajman, I wasn't sure the existence, the future of Preston uh, wasn't guaranteed, so that number may have changed. Uh, Dubai is the leading importer of branch campuses, which I think is uh, 27. Uh, although if Warren Fox in the audience, I know he can tell us exactly uh, how many Dubai has. Uh, Ras al Hema, seven, and Sharjah, one. And, and I have been fortunate to visit all these Emirates and be able to go out and actually see uh, the physical footprint of many of these campuses. And it's it's interesting to be able to get out and actually see what's happening besides Dubai and Abu Dhabi. There's a lot of activity, or some activity at least, in some of the other Emirates. Um, earlier, I mentioned that we did a survey of branch campuses around the world. I just wanted to, to pull a couple of pieces of data from that survey to give you uh, another little bit of context before I go into impacts. And this is just to, to show you the types of curriculum that is being offered worldwide. Business is the leading curriculum that we, we see a lot of MBAs are being offered via these endeavors, but a lot of the STEM areas with science, technology, engineering, mathematics, you can see here, um, have, are among the, le the leading uh, uh, curriculums that are being provided. Fashion, hospitality, liberal arts, social science is also uh, being part of the mix. And it, it varies on, on the country location, interest of the institution, interest, interest of the students in the country. Another phenomenon I think is interesting is who actually owns the facilities. Um, I'll, I'll start from the bottom and I'll move up. In, in many cases, these facilities and the enterprises are owned wholly outright by the foreign education provider. That means they're there on their own, own will. Uh, they're moving into the, the country based using their own resources to do so. In some cases, they rent facilities, and you can see that here, and that's a, a case in uh, Dubai International Academic City in many cases, that they rent or lease uh, uh, premises that were already uh, built. In some cases, they partner with a private entity. These are often real estate firms that are looking to develop both the campus and then to profit from uh, uh, the, the development of the land around the entity. We see that a lot in Asia. Uh, the Singapore model is one where the, the education partner actually provides space on an existing campus somewhere. There is no other partnership. There's no joint degree program. There's just the lending of academic space that exists on a university campus. And then a, a, another phenomenon um, that, is grow that has been growing rapidly, and, and particularly in the Middle East, is a, is a government partner, a government partner that provides some level of subsidy. It could be just facilities. It could be operating costs. Um, or it could be even, even providing scholarships for students. So there's a variety of models that we see in the development of these, of these branches. 
But more to the point, what's the impact? What are they actually doing? And so what I want to talk about here is uh, um, first frame this from a way that my, my colleague Kevin Kinter and I think about it in terms of capacity building. And we think that branches have one of two general orientations. And uh, one is being capacity, which means they're just there. They're, they're by their very presence, they are actually um, adding to the local capacity, but they're not actively building it. When they're building it, they're really working side by side with um, local stakeholders to help enhance the overall quality of life, effectiveness of social institutions, uh, and the overall economic prosperity uh, of the country that they're in. And so there's a, there's a difference here, and, and we see branches taking both models. Some they just go in, they provide an educational opportunity for students, and they are, are providing additional capacity that way. On the other hand, they're really actively interested in building the local communities and the local governments and uh, the local nations, and so they are really actively involved in building capacity. Most of my points at this point are going to be economic in nature. I, I'm going to frame out some of the initial economic contributions, sort of dividing them between being capacity or building capacity. Um, there's blurriness between these two concepts, and you can see where on one hand an institution could just be capacity uh, while doing the very similar things and trying to build capacity. But this comes out of some work that I had done with Bruce Johnston a while ago, really trying to think of, of higher education institutions as economic drivers. What are the variety of ways in which they contribute economically to our communities? And so some of the things I'm going to talk about apply to all universities, but you can see in certain circumstances there are special conditions for branch campuses. But they are, they are spenders and consumers. They receive money, whether that's from the home country or the host country, and they spend. Uh, they have to buy goods. They have to uh, build buildings. They have to employ individuals. So they are, these are entities that actually allow for the sort of uh, the attaining of resources and, and spending them out in the communities. They tend to be uh, employers. Uh, they, the branch campuses vary in size. Some might have 100 students. There are some uh, that have several thousand, and so the, uh, the number of individuals they employ will vary, but they are employers. A critical aspect is they're developers of human capital, that in the education of students, they are actually increasing the local capacity by uh, adding to the, the individual capacity of the workers in the region and the citizens of the region. They attract new students and staff, individuals who might not have otherwise been in that country or in that emirate, for example. Uh, they are attracting them there. Um, they are also um, a phenomenon that they may be keeping people there who would have otherwise left. Students who wanted a foreign education that may have wanted to go off to Europe or to Australia, they now have an opportunity within the emirates uh, or Qatar or Bahrain uh, to stay there in the country or in the region and pursue their educational uh, their, their, their educational programs, and then ultimately maybe even staying in the region rather than going away and staying there, leading to brain drain. They can be a source of foreign direct investment, uh, particularly in, in the wholly owned opportunities where the campus is actually transferring financial capital from one university to one country uh, to another. But they can also be an attractor of foreign direct investment in the sense that these are anchor institutions that countries in the home uh, uh, companies in the home country may end up following or may end up working with in partnership in the local country, and so they can be a way to attract foreign direct investment from other companies as well. Um, on the building capacity side, they can be much more actively involved, of course, in providing business assistance uh, in terms of helping local companies be successful in building out their, uh, their own opportunities. They can be a resource of community vitality. This is something we don't often think about, but these are institutions that are providing oftentimes um, cultural events or uh, sporting events or other sorts of things that the community or educational events that are open to the broader community that help ultimately uh, increase the value of being the quality of life of being in that particular community they foster research and innovation i know that's a critical question that is being discussed uh, with this group but they they are there as an economic as an educational entity and in many cases, they have started as teaching universities, but they are often transforming now into research institutions as well. And that can lead to what we call knowledge spillover, and that is what the knowledge that's produced in a branch campus or any campus for that matter gets spilled over into the local community and become economically viable, creating smart startups and such. Um, but they can also uh, provide opportunities for students to do internships and volunteering in the local community as well, which are both helping social institutions uh, and for-profit institutions. 
I want to split out a couple of things I just talked about. One is the research innovation side, because I know that's critically important. What we see around the world now, and we see it in the Middle East and we see a lot in Asia, that a lot of these branch campuses are developing their own research uh, ecosystem. They came to teach. They have a great interest in doing research, and they do it locally. They are doing research that is relevant to the local communities. Uh, in many cases, research that's not being done on the parent campus, or they are evolving the research that's being done on the parent, parent campus uh, to be able to engage in research that is locally relevant. Uh, they're creating research partnerships with local scientists at other universities. This also helps in sort of the capacity building aspect of by bringing in scientists within the existing educational ecosystem, bringing them into these campuses that may have a history of doing research because of the parent campus, we can help build capacity that way. Uh, it also helps with building up the local research infrastructure in a similar way, the possibility of building new labs, demonstrating ways in which um, the, the state-of-the-art research is being done back home and bringing that into the country that is importing the branch. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing local governments investing in these entities. Um, whereas the money would have traditionally been limited to, uh, to, to domestic institutions only, in many cases, the, the governments have actually seen it worthwhile to invest in the foreign education uh, providers to be able to help them build out the research, and oftentimes in partnership with existing domestic institution as a way to sort of incentivize collaboration as well. Uh, but these institutions also help train the next generation of local scientists. Some of them offer PhD programs often in conjunction with the parent campus where there is joint uh, supervisory capacity between the, the home and the host campus. But they're, they're ultimately training PhDs that will end up working in their region and therefore helping to build, further build the, um, the educational talent that exists to support the existing domestic institutions. The knowledge spillover phenomenon is an interesting one uh, and it's one that's highly developed in the Western world, the idea that we try to um, commercialize on the knowledge that is being produced in the in within our universities. Now, this is not something that we have perfect. Uh, certainly in the U.S., we are still struggling to, to see how we can replicate it in a variety of areas. In New York State, this is something we're dealing with significantly. Our, our governor just announced actually a new initiative to put tax-free zones by all SUNY campuses with the idea of being able to try to further incentivize uh, startup companies to be created across all of New York State, not just in New York City. Uh, but the reason is because we know the universities are a critical hotbed of, of new knowledge. They're creating new, they can help create startup companies. We take the knowledge, we make it, we, we turn them into uh, economically viable um, uh, knowledge that can be, be produced through new companies or actually to help existing corporations uh, uh, develop their research enterprises. I, they can also, universities and IBCs can also serve as neutral ground for short shared corporate R&D. And here you see a picture of the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering in Albany, which actually is the home of a cutting uh, a cutting edge academic program in nanotechnology, but it is also the home to the R&D infrastructure now for GE, for Intel, for, um, for Microsoft and several others that are looking at how do we create new microchips and, and uh, have ultimately actually created, uh, relocated the microchip industry at Albany, New York, because of what's happening in this, this neutral space, they sort of call it Switzerland, where companies can come together and work collaboratively in space um, that is shared by, that owned by a university. Uh, but we also, it's, it's more than just knowledge spillover. We, there are a variety of ways we can improve local, the local industries. Uh, internships, for example, contract courses, where you are working directly with a, a local company to provide education to their employees. Faculty who have expertise can provide advice and consulting. Uh, we can develop joint research pro projects between the university and between companies. Uh, but they can also serve as a pipeline to the home country industry as well. Once they, a university sets up shop there, uh, the, the, we, in some cases we've seen companies in, in the home countries more willing to export themselves and set up shop in those countries. An example I often like to point out is uh, we often think about STEM, but in Qatar, uh, they, they imported Northwestern University because one of their economic pillars is media. Uh, primarily with the headquarters of Al Jazeera, Northwestern has one of the leading journalism programs in the U.S. So the idea with importing Northwestern was to provide opportunities for students uh, in media, but also to have Northwestern work directly with Al Jazeera in partnership uh, together to help improve the media industry in the Middle East. It's not just all about economics, and I think it's really important to, to state. 
And this is where the, sort of the, the foreign education aspect really comes into play. Uh, there's something I call, I like to call academic capital spillover. This is more than just knowledge spillover, but the reason why you might import a branch campus is because you are hoping to, uh, to bring over an established academic and research culture, as opposed to creating a wholly new institution that has to do it on its own. You invest in a place like NYU that has an existing uh, uh, foundation of academic support and a, 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 an existing research culture that then can be replicated in the home or in the host country, uh, which the idea is will, will likely lead to, to more successes uh, more quickly because they have an existing academic uh, capital that they can pull on. You see knowledge transfer that will occur between faculty and staff, people who have an existing idea and ethos, they bring that over into the, uh, the, home, the, into the host country when they travel uh, or are seconded from the home country. Um, and there's also sort of a deep, deep academic governance culture, the idea that uh, we can take something that's existing, we can replicate it, we can move it overseas, uh, and more quickly build up an academic culture at large because we have this sort of really deep sense back home of what that, that means. Uh, there's also a, a diplomatic impact that I think is often overlooked, but there's a soft power issue that occurs here. Many host countries that are importing branches end up benefiting from oftentimes a unrecognized or um, unpurposeful legitimacy issue that a, a, a branch with a global brand name like NYU operating in a certain country uh, conveys on a legitimacy of respect upon that country that further helps to sort of raise the reputational value of that, uh, that country standing uh, regionally and I think uh, across the globe. So there is a, there is a strategy here in using an existing brand name of a, of a cultural institution, namely a university, to help raise uh, the sort of the soft power that a, a, a country has. They can help develop a, a deep cultural connection between both the home and the host country, which can be powerful economically and culturally and diplomatically. And this, they, they can also serve a platform for meetings between government leaders because these are, these are important entities that often garner the attention of, of leaders of both the home and the host country and provide an opportunity to bring them uh, together and to serve more connections. I'm almost finished. I just want to quickly say that th this is not a utopian world, however, and there are limitations. What I just talked about are the possible impacts that branches can have, but we've got to keep in mind these are startup organizations. You're not taking a you're not taking NYU out of New York City and just dumping it into Abu Dhabi. While there are benefits of of expanding an existing organization, these are still startups. They are 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 create, they are also creating a whole new institutions. Uh, you're not immediately replicating the parent, so you're not going to immediately see the benefits in the same way that you see in NYU. And of course, NYU has been around for decades, and it does take time to build up all educational institutions. They can be costly to the host government depending on the situation, but many times the hosts are subsidizing a lot, large number of costs. And it's important to be reflective on if the university or the country is getting the full return on investment. They can require changes in local regulations. Um, sometimes the questioning of double standards, because when you import a branch campus, there are special considerations uh, that they may not want to apply with local regulations or may not need to, and they may change the nature of what they are. There could be a lack of quality control when a, a university opens up a branch campus, is branch campus five or 7,000 miles uh, a way that quality control can often be problematic. They're not used to dealing in that sort of environment. Um, I think a big issue is a local, local lack of local commitment. These institutions are not going to close their home campus so they get in trouble, but they could close the, the, the branch campus. And so I think we're seriously considering the, the lack or the, 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 uh, the total engagement of these institutions in the host country. The older they are, the more likely they are to stay. But I think it's important to realize that there is a, uh, there can be a lack of local commitment. Uh, some are more interested in being capacity than building it. I talked about that earlier. And there are cultural clashes. Whenever you have a cultural institution like a university opening in a foreign country, you're ultimately going to have cultural clashes. A number of, of issues that we can uh, that that need to be worked out. I think my my time is is done there. Uh, the advantage of being where I am is that I, I can't hear anybody cutting me off. So. Uh, I'm trying to hold to my time. I'll just say that we have a couple of, of resources that if you're interested in branch campuses, uh, globalhighered.org, we have a, a pretty up-to-date list of all the branch campuses around the world. We have that map I showed you in an interactive format. 
and State of Bibliography at branch campuses. And we also have a great partnership with Phil Altbeck and his group at the Center for International Higher Ed. And you're going to be hearing from Phil in a minute, uh, where we are developing a website on, uh, with them that is also chronicling the development of research and news and uh, other issues related to cross-border higher education. Uh, and we're both active uh, writers in terms of the Chronicle of Higher Ed, Inside Higher Ed, trying to talk about daily phenomenons that are happening around the world related to cross-border higher ed. So I thank you for your time. I, I wish you all the best with your rest of the conference and the discussion today. And again, my apologies for not be able, being able to join you. Take care. On behalf of all of you, I would like to thank Professor Lane for this valuable and informative uh, lecture. Now I'll we'll move to our second speaker, Professor Philip Albach. Professor Philip Albach is a research professor and director of, uh, of the Center of International Higher Education in the Lynch School of Education at Boston College. Uh, he is a winner of Hulihan Award for Distinguished Contribution to International Education by the Association of International Education. Let us welcome Professor Philip Albach. You do have 20 minutes, Professor Philip. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here in Abu Dhabi. What I'm going to do this morning in 25, 20 or 25 minutes is to provide you with a broad general analysis of what I think are the key issues in globalization and internationalization in higher education. It's kind of globalization 101. And I'm going to step back from the more practical aspects that Jason Lane just discussed and to try to give you a broad perspective. Why am I doing this? Because I think all too often, those of us who are involved in this international higher education enterprise don't think carefully enough about the broader underlying factors which affect us, our partners, and higher education more broadly in this globalized world. So I think it's important to have a critical perspective as well as just plunging into the branch campus movement, franchising of institutions, or all of the other aspects of globalized higher education today. So that's my purpose. We are clearly in a world where the globalization issue, not only in education, but in the broader economy, politics, and society and culture, are central to most things that we do. And there is no part of the world that is more enmeshed in this development, set of developments, than this exact region. So these issues are of central importance to you. Flows of people, flows of knowledge, trade relations, branch campuses, and all of the similar arrangements that we see in the world today. Further, in higher education and elsewhere, this global land landscape has become more complex with the advent exactly of cross-border initiatives and other non-traditional elements of internationalization. We have moved far beyond the transfer of students from one country to another, although, as I will discuss in a few minutes, Student mobility is still a core part of the globalization landscape. We're just entering into the era of the MOOCs, the massive online open courses that we have all read so much about. 
We have no idea, ladies and gentlemen, of what the impact of these MOOCs will be. We do know that they are largely coming from the rich English-speaking academic systems and are being disseminated without much thought or care to their adaptability to other parts of the world today. So the MOOCs, as well as other elements, require also careful and critical attention as they become a more central part of the discussion of international higher education. Let me start out with a few definitions, because all too often we enter into these discussions, frankly speaking, not knowing very much what we're talking about. So I'm going to define three terms which I think underline these questions. One of them is globalization itself. And the way I define that, it is that globalization implies the broad economic and other trends, including information technology, the global use of English, the rise of the private sector in higher education, marketization aspects of higher education, and others, which are more or less inevitable aspects of the modern period. In other words, there is little that we can do to shape these globalization trends. They are part of the environment in which we live, and we need to adjust to them. We can reject some, we can modify a little bit, but they are the context. What I mean by internationalization are the specific policies that governments, academic institutions, even departments or programs may develop to operate in the global environment. Here, there is much room for initiative, and institutions and governments can choose in what ways they wish, to, they wish to participate or not in the new environment. You as individuals may choose to study overseas. You may choose to go to the United States or to France or to China. This is your internationalization agenda. Your country may choose to permit foreign branch campuses in the country, or not. In China, for example, the only way that foreign institutions can set up shop and operate in China is with an equal Chinese partner. They cannot do it on their own. So there are different ways of adjusting to the globalization environment, and internationalization I define as those different ways. My final term is multinationalization. Some people call it McDonaldization. And this means that academic programs, scientific programs, institutions, companies that are from one country that set up shop and operate in another. Branch campuses, I suppose, would be very much part of that environment as Jason Lane has just so nicely described. Franchise operations, that is, where an institution in country A, almost always a rich English-speaking Western country, licenses an institution, sometimes a business enterprise, sometimes an academic institution, to offer its degrees overseas. That's what I call McDonaldization, because it's exactly what the McDonald's company does. It licenses its hamburgers to be produced, halal style, in the Middle East. 
but it doesn't actually run the program. So there are different kinds of multinationalization also. Let me point out as well that both globalization and internationalization have an important element of inequality which is attached to them. Again, so often, we don't recognize this. We don't think about it. We just plunge into relationships without much thought to who, who controls, who benefits, who calls the shots, who makes the decisions. And we heard very little from Jason Lane this morning about this aspect of the branch campus movement. Who controls? That's the basic issue. And generally speaking, in internationalization, it's the countries, academic institutions, who have more advantages in the modern world who, 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 who exercise this control. There are, in the world of higher education and elsewhere, what I've called centers and peripheries. The centers, the rich historic universities in the West, for the most part, tend to be much more influential than peripheral institutions which are more dependent upon them. This is again part of a pattern of inequality which I would argue even in the era of globalization is very much with us and very much part of the necessity to understand these sets of issues. Let me also mention another, maybe less pleasant aspect of internationalization, and that is its growing commercialization. Increasingly, the motivation for internationalization is commercial. Cross-border initiatives of all kinds have become big business. Who pays? You have to ask the question. Who benefits financially from these sets of relations? International students have also become big business. They contribute now some 20 billion US dollars to the American economy, somewhat less although similarly large amounts to the UK, to Australia, and to some other countries which tend to charge high tuition fees to their overseas students within the country. Some have estimated <clears throat> that student mobility, just student mobility, is a trillion dollar industry globally today and growing, mainly profiting the rich countries and particularly the English-speaking academic centers around the world. A few countries and a growing number see internationalization as a profit center. Many individual universities, in fact, which are engaged in the branch campus movement, some of them, Jason has mentioned in his talk, although not by individual institution, are in the business to make money. And they are clear and open about that fact. Some countries, Australia and the United Kingdom particularly, see international student mobility as an income source. And increasingly, some American states are, again, quite openly talking about using international mobility as a source of revenue. The most interesting examples at the moment are New York and Washington State, 
where government officials have touted their ability to raise money from cross-border and international student mobility. Many institutions use what I've called agents and recruiters, highly paid in some cases, to lure students to come to their campuses. Again, this is another issue, but one that's worth discussing. Let me spend a few minutes on history. It's interesting, and for academic institutions, which themselves have a long historical memory, I think rather important. Universities have always been international institutions. At one time, they operated in a common language, Latin, for the European university uh, systems. And those institutions in medieval Europe had large numbers of international students and saw themselves as contributing to a broad social, cultural, and employment mission, not just for their own country, but for the European context. I might point out also that one of the most important academic institutions historically, the Al-Hazar in Cairo, which by the way is today, and I think this is an important point, the only academic institution in the world which does not operate in the Western academic model. It has its own academic model, at least the, the theological and cultural faculties at Al-Hazar. All the universities everywhere else in the world, all of them in this region, for example, are essentially Western-style institutions in the way they are organized. And I think that's an important element to think about when you consider both internationalization and how these foreign transplants, in a way, many of them centuries old, but still stemming from an academic tradition which is not indigenous to the region. So again, historically, academic institutions have always been in some kind of tension with their societies. My argument is that even in the context of globalization and commercialization, when so many see universities in purely market terms, it's important to keep in mind that academic institutions in the past millennia have been important con contributors to social, societal development. They are, in many ways, the most important public good institutions in the world. They contribute broadly to the society, and that's important to keep in mind, and not to lose as we focus so much on training for the workforce, on applied research, on university industry collaboration, all of which are of central importance to society, but so too are the broader public good missions of higher education. And very often, globalization, for the reasons I mentioned before, tend to de-emphasize that important role. Let me say just a very few things, because I have not much time left, about some of the elements of globalization and internationalization, just to give you some examples so that you can think about my broader comments in a more specific uh, context. I'll say a few words about global English. Here I am in the UAE speaking in English, and I see very few of you wearing your headsets. If you came to my university, 
and lectured in Arabic, everyone would be wearing their headsets. So English has become kind of the Latin of the era of globalization, and it's important. It's the main language of scholarly communication, books and journals, international conferences, and scholarly discourse all take place in English. I am old enough to remember that when I went to Europe early in my career, scholars were happy to deliver their papers in English or in German or in French, sometimes in Spanish, and expect the audience to understand them. Now, academic conferences in Europe or elsewhere are typically in English alone, or maybe English and the language of the country <clears throat> that the conference is taking place in. Keep in mind, and you in the UAE are very much aware of this, even in my couple days here, I've encountered some conversations about this matter. Language is culture, and what happens to a higher education system that moves its language from the local medium, or in this case the regional medium, to English is a very interesting and deep question. One very brief story. About 20 years ago, the Minister of Education of the Netherlands recommended to the Dutch Parliament, let us shift the language of higher education in Holland to English. We are, we are a, a rich trading nation. Everybody anyway speaks English. And it would make us much more attractive in the early days of the EU for foreign students. The parliament, after long debate, said no. And the reason they said no is they didn't want to lose Dutch culture. So today, in Holland, there are programs in English, but the language of the Dutch system is still Dutch. So these are important questions, issues also. The internet has expanded the use of English. And of course, English is the major second language of everybody. I like to point out there are more people who speak English in India than who speak English in England. And there are more people who study English in China than there are studying English in the United States. So English is important, but it has its questions. And countries which are forced or want to use English as the global language have interesting issues to deal with. China, for example, greatly stresses that its professors should write articles in the global recognized academic journals in part to raise their scores in the global rankings of higher education. And this has twisted, in some ways, the orientations of Chinese academics because it's much more difficult for them to write in a language which is not their own and, to, and also to deal with the norms and values of the English-speaking academic world. Let me conclude with a few comments on international students and maybe one or two on, on uh, uh, branch campuses and such issues. Um, there are now more than three million international students studying outside the borders of their own country. And many estimates are that by the year 2025, there'll be eight million. So this phenomenon is growing. And it's not just flow, it's mainly a flow actually from Asia to the English speaking and to some extent to the European Union continental countries. But it's not just such a flow. There is an internal flow in the Middle East. There is an internal flow in Latin America and elsewhere. So the flows of international students are complex, but largely still south to north. The impact of international students is tremendous. 
globally, about 12 billion U.S. dollars just from international students to the American economy. Similar numbers, Australia and the U.K. International students, when they return home, are carriers of a common or perhaps the national academic culture from where they studied. Many of you in this room know much better than I how that works. Because you were international students, you do have foreign degrees, and you have brought elements of a common academic culture. And finally, many international students don't return home. That's not the case mostly in the Middle East, but it is the case for India and for China. For example, we have good statistics that show that about 80% of the students from India and China who have studied in the United States over 20 years' time have not returned home, tremendously benefiting the U.S. economy and doing, I think, damage to the economies of China and India. I'm going to stop at this point. I could provide you with many amusing examples of how franchising works, of how the curriculum has been changed, about the fact that business education globally, the famous MBA degree, is an American academic invention that may or may not be entirely relevant to your particular economy. And we know how wonderfully MBA holders messed up the United States economy in our recent recession. So what I have tried to do in this short presentation is to give you a sense of the complexity, some of the issues which I think you have to, we all have to think about. Those of us who are planning branch campuses of our own Western universities overseas, and those of us who still have the ability to say yes or no to various kinds of international ventures within your countries and regions? And what are the terms and conditions which you can, and in my, my argument, should put on the flows of internationalization that are very much part of our world today? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Elbach, for this important information you provided. The speaker now is Dr. Arif Al Hamadi. Dr. Arif Al Hamadi has professional experience in the academic and telecommunication fields, and currently is serving in Abu Dhabi Education Council as the executive director of higher education sector and executive vice chancellor of Khalifa University of Science. Please welcome Dr. Arif. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Uh, I'm going to speak in Arabic, so I would like uh, non-Arabic speakers to put the headphone, please. Uh, <laughs> that's following your, uh, your recommendation, I think. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome you all. I will give you today a presentation about the strategic plan of the uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, and I will talk about uh, the international universities that we have here in Abu Dhabi throughout our plan. Abu Dhabi has a political an economic agenda and there's a structure for working in Abu Dhabi. It is adopted by the Executive Council and Education Council and uh, the higher education sector is trying to adopt this plan so it becomes a part of the educational 
structure of Abu Dhabi and serving our plan for 2030. So we have three main axes, such as encouraging research, scientific research and innovation in Abu Dhabi, and also connecting the outcomes of the education to the needs of our emirate. We will showcase some of the numbers related uh, to Abu Dhabi. 56% of youth between the age of 20 and 24 are enrolled in universities. So we are above the international average. The number of Emiratis who hold degrees, uh, diplomas, and uh, per R, 27%. Added to that, the percentage of the uh, expats the uh, percentage decreases to 21% because a lot of our labor are not qualified. They don't have diplomas. So we are under the average. But we need to take into consideration that Abu Dhabi or the Emirates are still uh, a, a young country and a lot of uh, the uh, older generations are not educated. So the percentage of who, those who are enrolled in uh, the higher education are 40,000. 10, 10,000 of them are expats. For girls, uh, or the ratio of girls to boys is two over one, which means that the number of girls enrolled in higher education in Abu Dhabi is higher than the boys. I cannot talk about uh, the reasons now, but we have a lot of reasons. The percentage of those who are enrolled in uh, private universities in Abu Dhabi is 27%. And this is in comparison to international levels. For example, in Japan, we have 75%. And in uh, Britain, for example, the UK, a lot, most of the universities are subsidized by the government. Today, we have 11,000 uh, students in the uh, private universities. But a lot of them are uh, nationals. We are talking also about federal universities such as the UAE, Zayed, and the Technical University. This in increased uh, the percentage of those enrolled uh, to 62%. Regarding private uh, schools, uh, which I mean business-related schools, 17%, but as for the, for the public schools, uh, which we call Sorbonne, INSEAD, uh, New York University, and Khalifa University, reached 8%. Last year, it was 6%. Today, it reached 8%, it, it, and it is ever-increasing in private universities. We go back to previous uh, lectures, and we see that it is true that New York University, Sorbonne University, they are there, and they have their own reputation, but our students, our national students, are there, in governmental universities, and governmental universities are shaping education in the government, but not private universities, definitely, especially the federal universities, which are trying today to take the helm of education, higher education in the UAE. We have several uh, aspects for our plan. I shall try to explain it uh, further. Uh, what we want uh, during uh, the next seven years to have an academic achievement individually and collectively alike, as well, as well as finding employment for the graduates at the moment, especially the nationals. Thirdly, to uh, have achievements in scientific uh, aspects. These are the issues that we are trying to implement. And how does that impact the economy, the increase in the individual's revenues uh, and the GDP for the country to measure the 
the projects uh, and its impact on the private uh, sector, all these issues, we are looking at it on the long run. The system here in the plan will be tackling different uh, aspects or pillars. One of them is governance. The governance model, how does the universities work? Uh, how can we explain its relationship with the government, with other institutions? Uh, information, how can we get information? The student management system, how, can, how is it linked between different universities? Opportunities, educational opportunities, which are there. Uh, do we have all these specializations? What about uh, the majors uh, and uh, the kind of vocational uh, education, for instance, or higher education? Are, are they there? Do we have these opportunities? What about the quality of education, the competence of the teachers, the students uh, alike, uh, the uh, international accreditations, the internationalization, the number of students who have studied abroad outside of the country and they have uh, uh, participated in other uh, universities abroad? Uh, what about the foreign languages taught in these universities? This is all called internationalization. We have funding now. What are the sources of funding for the universities uh, in Abu Dhabi? Uh, what about the fees, scholastic fees or university fees? What, uh, what about uh, the labor market, uh, the outcome of education? And at last, we have the uh, scientific uh, or educational research. All these pillars, we have tackled it in the policy of higher education, and we try to find solutions to uh, the challenges that are there. I shall really uh, speak about that in brief and try to give you some of the solutions through the strategy of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Today, if we count the number of students, interchange or exchange of students, Emirat, uh, not only Emiratis, but other students, those who are here in our universities, and those who uh, have studied a course for instance, outside of Abu Dhabi in international universities, uh, the rate is very low. Perhaps one university participating in this uh, student exchange. I haven't really put the names of the universities on purpose because my own data needs validation. And uh, therefore, I haven't really uh, written the names of the universities uh, in concern. We have a challenge here to, to have these students uh, uh, exchanged between us and international universities. If we uh, count the uh, quantities of the doctors who, who are really teaching in our universities and those who have higher degrees out of the 100 top universities all over the world, according to the Shanghai uh, categorization, for instance, we notice that the rating changes from university to another. But the universities, private universities, those who have really opened its own branches here have risen uh, this rating in the presence of universities um, also have a smaller uh, ratings. This really uh, gives way for the quality of the teachers and education and the quality of teachers who are there according to uh, the university's rating. Perhaps it might not be the sole rating, but one of the ratings there is. Uh, the rate of uh, students we notice that this is changing from one university to the other, but governmental universities or universities funded by the government or via the government, even those who have international campuses uh, inside the country, less than 10. Less than 10 students for each uh, teacher. But uh, regarding the profit-making uh, private universities, they have more than 10 students for a teacher. 
These are some of the remarks that we are really noticing in these universities and trying to find out what are the universities that have a certain number of students less than uh, the needed or the, the uh, wanted for. Researchers, the number of publications the researchers offered for the uh, teachers that have a PhD, um, these researchers are not uh, uh, announced. And uh, we have two universities who have good citations, which means that the quality of research that they have are good. One of them is the Emirates University, the Faculty of Medicine in the Emirates University. We have uh, res uh, universities which are research oriented, others are not. But the average is very low compared to international standards in this regard. Same slide given. Um, to uh, given previously, I want to compare between these two slides. Uh, business management is one of the most important uh, specializations given to uh, our students. Uh, architecture is rising, but computer science graduates uh, are also increasing. The country definitely has a certain um, uh, knowledge-based economy. We should know the rate uh, of the students really ex exceeding the sciences uh, degrees. The rate of uh, nationals who teach in the universities, 3%. Of course, governmental universities are higher than the private, but uh, the rate is 3%. It's very modest. They uh, teach in the UAE universities. We have a number of challenges. One of the challenges that we have funding in UAE, which comes without the presence of uh, uh, a party that links this uh, funding to modernizing the opportunities and defining the opportunities. It should be linked to funding. This is uh, one of the aspects of the challenges that we are facing. We need universities that open up specializations that benefit the UAE and Abu Dhabi in particular, and uh, not uh, that the board of directors decided that this specialization should be uh, uh, should be there. It should be linked to the access and the availability and uh, and the benefit of the UAE. How much do we need vocational majors, other higher education majors, and so on and so forth? In this way, we can maneuver, and uh, and we are trying to find solutions for that. The same thing here applies for the lack of uh, scientific research. There is no independent committee. We notice a number of universities take funding from the government without going back to uh, the funding of the educational or scientific research, which is linking the researchers to the strategy of 2030 strategy of the UAE. These are one of the challenges, the demands of the labor force. The biggest problem we are facing in the labor force is the lack of information, necessary information, on which we can build plans, uh, work plans for the academic institutions. Also, this is one of uh, the main challenges, the presence definitely of the Ministry of Higher Education. And how can uh, this uh, ministry play uh, an important role in this uh, respect? All universities are licensed uh, via the Ministry of Higher Education, but the presence of uh, Abu Dhabi Council, Educational Council, to limit the number of universities in Abu Dhabi. We have 17 universities here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, it is less than the, the uh, other Emirates in the UAE, but 17. Uh, for 40,000 students, uh, perhaps we can put them in one university in another country. Here we have 17 universities. 
to where we want to reach 50, 60, or no, we focus on the ones that are there and develop it so that we can have much more number of students and it would be much more productive. Produ productive. Perhaps our policy not to open further branches, especially the profit based uh, universities. We are focusing on the quality and the kind of teachings within these universities. The initiatives that we have suggested, I have no time uh, f uh, to explain that one, one of the initiatives uh, uh, awaiting acceptance is to create or establish a committee for research funding. This is part of 2030 Abu Dhabi vision and plan. To link labor force, with the impact of education through uh, through uh, groups, uh, we are trying to give them certain specializations needed according to the demands of uh, the labor market. We try to define the specializations that are of interest to Abu Dhabi and try to uh, gather these uh, funding as much as uh, possible. The universities present in Abu Dhabi is of vital importance. We want to know how many students are there, what are their specializations, what are they doing. This electronic linkage will be going on. Uh, so after years and years, we can know how to build upon the qualifications of these uh, students to create employments for these students after four years after they graduate. Uh, we have other projects, uh, academic directives. We can really consult and give him advice to change his own or her own uh, specialization. To level up with the quality of the students and uh, the uh, university programs, we have a project at the moment. Uh, for one single uh, uh, specialization, civil engineering. It is uh, being compared to uh, hundreds of other uh, universities. We have seen that the impact of this uh, specialization uh, is important. Uh, three uh, uh, universities of Abu Dhabi have participated within with these uh, uh, universities. We want to know the level of the students graduating from Abu Dhabi compared to other students graduating elsewhere uh, abroad. This project, we are working on that uh, in the phase two, which is the ICT, Information Communication Technology, and uh, our graduates. Last slide. We have focused on different uh, pathways. We have given or put in the plan uh, more than one specialization, more than one university to uh, showcase more than one specialization. We have targets definitely to abide by, to increase the number of the PhD holders of the nationals in the research centers and the universities. We have also a plan to uh, sign agreements with the Ministry of Higher Education to uh, organize uh, the Ministry Educational Council with the Abu Dhabi Educational Council with the Ministry of Higher Education. There is a plan to fund uh, the institutions of higher education in Abu Dhabi, whether research uh, um, institutions or the funding formula, which we call the funding formula, uh, where every university gets its own funding according to the demands and the needs of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. This is the last slide. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Arif, for your valuable uh, lecture. We, uh, we have about half an hour for questions. Hopefully, uh, or kindly, state your name and the institution that you belong to clearly so that we can uh, uh, really know and register. Jamil Mohammed from ECAE. Philip, uh, speak. Um, with globalized education, uh, it has particular culture, particular uh, values which are embedded in the dominant ideology, the liberal Western ideology. 
the transplant universities which come to the Arab world also carry those ideologies, those beliefs there. When you view these transplant universities in the United Arab Emirates, you find that they emphasize more on their cultural values rather than producing doctors, engineers, architects. So as an example, when you read the Arab knowledge report, the 332 page uh, Arab knowledge report, you would find that they use the word freedom 385 times there. So therefore, we should be looking and emphasizing more on the practical academic aspect rather than the cultural aspect. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ali, Dr. Ali, I'm from the scholarship office. I have a question to Dr. Philip uh, regarding the quality of education. I mean, you haven't touched on the quality of education in the branches or the outside the main, uh, main uh, campus. And you th I sense also that you're not, you are not, not with internalization of education. Am I correct? Thank you. Can I? I'd like to respond. Um, so the last, the, these two questions. Um, I think somehow it's more efficient to do it that way before uh, you and I both forget the questions that were answered. Uh, and I'll try to be brief so we can have as many people as possible. Um, it's a very interesting question concerning how much the branch campuses keep to their own academic cultures. And I think largely they do, although it would be very interesting to hear from you and others as to what, what is the linking, the combination of academic cultures in the branches from, from their home versus their adaptation to the cultural and academic norms of the place in which they are working. And I think this will, maybe this is the next project that we can get Jason Lane, uh, plus some colleagues from here, to work on because I think this is, at present, a black box. We don't know. And it would be very interesting to, to find out. To the second question, what is the quality of education in the branches? Great question. We also don't know. And we don't know how much linked the branch campuses are to the quality of their home campus. We hope, we assume, that they are linked in that way. That's why we take, you take, these name brands, famous universities, like Sorbonne or NYU, and invite them to come here and spend a lot of your money on it. But I think you need to evaluate and maybe you have, exactly how effective they are. One of the worries which I have had about branch campuses is how much are they really like the home campus? Can they attract teachers from the home campus to come, not just for a weekend or a few days, but to live at the branch campus and infuse the, the culture of New York or of Paris in the institution. So I think these are really central questions, and we don't have good answers. We need to have those answers. Um, your final question, do, do, do I believe in internationalization? Yes, I do but I believe in internationalization 
with a critical face. I think we really need to understand the, the costs and the benefits, the good parts and the bad parts. Overall, in my view, from my research and experience over time, the benefits outweigh very much the costs. The problem, which I, and the reason of, for the tone of my lecture, is that too often those people who are involved in internationalization discuss nothing of the costs and only the benefits. I'm just trying to change the balance, but I'm not opposed to it. السلام عليكم الدكتور قسيم الشناق كلية تربية جامعة الإمارات Emirates University My question is uh, to Dr. Arif The uh, nationals, especially the males are not getting into teaching and the teachers, male teachers are almost inexistent. So I think this is very important. This is a need. And the Abu Dhabi Knowledge uh, Authority and Learning Authority needs to take this into consideration and need to, to think about strategies to attract male students. Yesterday, they asked a question about uh, teaching or training uh, the teacher to uh, encourage innovation uh, in students, we have a certain, we have a department related to this thing, and uh, we encourage also reflective practitioners. This is uh, one of the things we do. Thank you. Lecture, I am Aisha al Awadi. Supervisor at the Ministry of Education, uh, PhD student writing thesis about international human resources management of the foreign universities in the UAE. Uh, I would like to ask where do you see the future of foreign universities in the UAE in the coming uh, around 10 years or 15 years? Thank you. Hi, this is a question for the professor. Um, my name is Sham Hashemi. I'm with Oman Brunei Investment Company. We're a private equity investor investing in uh, higher education and K through 12. My question is, you talked about internationalization regarding uh, higher education. What do you feel about uh, the K through 12 market? Um, does it make sense to have brands from the West come to the market here in, in the lower education, the K through 12? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I am Adil Risk advisor for open uh, learning and uh, remote learning. Dr. Arif, the, ask, the question is for you. You said and you mentioned the electronic linkage between the universities and the labor market. And I can see that there's a large network that hasn't been used enough in the UAE. And I'm talking here about the world uh, web and uh, this is a special internet for learning institutions and the government, but I can say that they are not using it or using its applications uh, enough, especially if we are talking about the future of learning and teaching. I want to know why. My second part of the question is the following. What we are witnessing through the internships we are getting from universities is the decrease in the number of 
students in some of the faculties uh, of computer sciences. This is even uh, the, the students in computer sciences are transferring to other faculties, and we are witnessing that. Uh, I'm thinking this through the internships that they are doing uh, in our company. What's the reason? My last question. The National Qualification Authority, what's its relation with higher education in terms of studying the market, accreditation, etc.? My last point. The National Qualification Authority, what's its relation with higher education, will it always be a substitute for government and private institutions and high education? My last question, will we witness in Abu Dhabi soon an electronic university? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I, I try to answer them as, uh, you know, uh, as quick as possible. Uh, no, sorry. In terms of the question related to the education uh, faculty, yes, uh, it's true. Students, especially Emiratis, do not like to enroll in these faculties because the science faculty is only in uh, the UAE University. They do not have a lot of choices. Now, in the Sorbonne University, they opened a scientific uh, branch and in Khalifa University. This will benefit the diversity of students, of course. Uh, and the linkage between uh, the uh, science uh, faculty and the uh, labor market, if, they, if the student studies physics or chemistry, he doesn't know what will he be working. It is very important for the student to know what's, uh, what his job is going to be. So now, the student's effectiveness, and uh, based on surveys, we see that we need graduates in mathematics, etc., and we cannot have enough of these. So it is necessary now for the universities to prepare or pre to prepare uh, the graduates in order to uh, know the, qu the, the quality of such a jobs. And uh, of course, they need, uh, the students need to know that if they study mathematics or physics or chemistry, you can work something else other than teaching. It is very important because now when the student enters in such a branch or faculty, he doesn't know how this is going to be linked to the labor market. So an academic academic uh, advice is given to the students in the first year, and we will be working on that in uh, the authority in order to give advice and guidance to such students, whom we will be trying to encourage um, in concerning the uh, remote learning. We will be uh, connecting the students to the student management system. They all have one system. Some of them use another system. Uh, this will help us to know where the student is and what is he studying. Then will we be uh, connecting them through the uh, network, and this network will be used a lot more in the future. I know now we are not using it, it is not connected uh, up to the level we need, but we are encouraging today the universities to connect to it, and we want uh, 128 university to connect to it, and other schools also, and I hope that with uh, the uh, increasing uh, awareness uh, level, the number of uh, students or um, learning institutions using this network will increase. Today we have the higher College of Technology and the UAE University. They are among the highest or the best users of this network. Concerning the NQF, 
um, a decree was adopted saying that it is responsible for the accreditation of universities and schools. They need to coordinate between them and the higher education uh, ministry that gives accreditation and uh, licenses to universities. So. The, uh, now they are uh, debating how will they plan the coming phases. We are waiting for the NQF and the Higher Education Ministry to give us an update uh, about uh, the uh, stage they reached in their debate. On to the two questions asked. Uh, what is the future of foreign universities in the UAE? Uh, I have no idea. Um, uh, one must look at the failures of foreign universities both in the UAE and elsewhere. There have been some in this country which have not succeeded, a few. Uh, there are a bigger number that have failed in Singapore. So it depends in significant part on the policies of the sponsoring governments the regulatory frameworks, the quality assurance agencies, and so on. And I sim there's simply no way to predict exactly what's going to happen. Are they going to disappear in the UAE? I don't think so, because I think, I think there's a need for them, uh, both to help with the higher education arrangements in the country, and also to serve the uh, expatriate uh, community. We haven't spoken much about the Indian universities which have flocked to Dubai, I think largely to make money, uh, but they do serve a purpose and a population. Um, does K-12 uh, have an international role? That's a very interesting question. I, I, have, I have two answers. One of them is kind of an ideological answer from me which is that K-12 education is a, nat is a national patrimony. It is something that belongs to a country. And to have foreigners significantly involved in it is deeply problematical. That's one answer. The other answer is, yes, innovative schools, international schools and others, can play an interesting role in education reform and in serving particular national needs. So I am speaking here out of both sides of my mouth because I think it's a complicated and very interesting question. I'd like to add one point here relating to the effectiveness of the branch campuses. Uh, I think the effectiveness of branch uh, campuses should be measured by uh, their engagement and in, in how innovative their way of teaching, how they're engaged in building the capacity, the research capacity, the cross-border scientific collaboration between the, the mother campus and the branch campus. I think this is, this is what we, we look at when we evaluate those uh, campuses in the, in the uh, host countries. Uh, from uh, my experience, the question was, or the point that uh, uh, Professor al uh, introduced, are these uh, branch campus using the same way of teaching or the same program? From my experience, uh, I, I talk about the Sorbonne University. Yes, the Sorbonne University, the same program that was taught in, in Sorbonne, Paris Sorbonne, is taught here at Paris uh, Abu Dhabi. The same faculty are teaching here. S same way of teaching are, are used here. So I think this is how we measure the effectiveness of, of uh, this university and how they contribute to the enhancement of the human resource development. I think the internationalization of education, yes, has a positive contribution because it will widen the, the student option. It will, uh, uh, the competition between this institution will result in better serving the needs of uh, the student, as well as uh, knowledge spill over and uh, collaboration in research. This also will have 
positive, positive contribution, contribution to the development, the social and economic development of uh, the country. Uh, for the question uh, regarding uh, uh, for the question that was asked about uh, the future of uh, international universities here in Abu Dhabi, us uh, we are trying to monitor the outcomes of these universities who are measuring these outcomes in comparison with outcomes from the Abu Dhabi University. So we have data about the quality of teachers in comparison with uh, government university teachers. We are taking also the outcomes uh, and the data taken from the results of tests uh, taken by the students. We have a lot of uh, tools to measure and standards that allow us to evaluate such universities and we have a citation in Emirates we say if if you are doing something we will be evaluating your work so we are evaluating the investment and the investment of the governments in such universities and we give reports, periodical reports, about how these universities are working and serving education in Abu Dhabi. Marina, and I'm from Finland. Um, talking about internet, internationalization of uh, higher education, I think the development of technology and internet will be very essential to this. Uh, economist Ronald Coase uh, received a Nobel Prize from his work on looking at what makes centralized organizations form and when the same activity is done on open markets. And the key idea there was transaction costs. When transaction costs are high, centralized organizations form. When those radically drop, the same activity happens on an open market. Now, internet enables, in education, the transaction cost to go down. Access to information, access to people, uh, teachers, uh, is becoming lower and lower. So to me, it seems that it's less about bringing resources in and even more about actually reaching out. And from that perspective, uh, Ankabut and other initiatives uh, and, and the great opportunity that United Arab Emirates has is a great opportunity for reaching out. And uh, if you look at MOOCs that the US have been developing, I think those are less about teaching and learning and more about marketing. It's more about content. It's less really about the stuff that we're talking about here. So I'd like to hear about your reflections on, on the role of, uh, of technology and internet and, and how university can use those to reach out. Thank you. I can answer this question. Yes, uh, the role of technology. Today we have lots of uh, uh, universities, especially, for example, New York University have the international branch in, in the UAE uh, and in Abu Dhabi, and then they have another branch, I think, in Singapore. And uh, we have uh, the Ankabut uh, the Network, which was just mentioned, the Research and Education Network in the UAE that connect all the universities together and connect them to their counterpart, Internet2, Giant, and all the other international network on a high-speed Internet dedicated only for education. And uh, internet, for example, New York have, are the, 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 the highest user on the international link. Uh, HCT is the highest user on the local link. And that's, why is this? Because HCT have multi-campuses, 17 campuses in the UAE. So they have to talk to each other and exchange lectures sometimes. If you have a faculty missing in your uh, you know, uh, department and you want to be you know, using another one in Dubai or in uh, Fujairah, you use uh, the education network for that purpose. The same thing, I think New York have more than seven uh, lectures happening between New York and uh, Abu Dhabi. So I think technology in the UAE in terms of infrastructure is very good. Uh, the international network that we have here, the Ankabut and connectivity internationally for Sorbonne and for New York and other universities have been very useful for them to uh, keep the, uh, the interaction uh, rather than 
uh, flying people in and out. And I think uh, one of the problems that they have is the accreditation uh, have some restriction on how much of your lecture can be distance. And I don't know why the reason for that, but they must have the accreditation or the ministry have their own reason. But there are some limitation on what level of uh, distance learning you can make and so they don't lose their license. And I think uh, this is something now moving. It's a threshold that maybe 10% before 20, maybe in the future you will have a full university that are distance learning. But this is a matter of quality assurance that the ministry, I'm sure, they know what they are doing there. We have only one more question. Please give it to the ladies there. Uh, my name is Ambarin uh, Hajian Fard. I'm of uh, mixed uh, Pakistani and Iranian background. As a foreign worker in this country, when I entered, uh, we have a policy that, you know, uh, the degrees need to be validated. When I migrated to Iran, my degrees were validated. When I came to UAE, there's a system in place. What I want to know is, in terms of online education and as a continuing uh, student, if I get a degree, even from an Ivy League uh, university, what uh, do you see as the possibility that it will be considered you know, of equal validity as the paper degree that I got from a university? And what do you see in terms of future also? Thank you. Let's take another question. There is another lady on the, the back there, please. Assalamu alaikum. Saham Oram Jamat Alain de Lorum with Tignogia. Basal Dr. Arif, Badan Nakatal Hadretta Kultalia, and in his bit Italian. Some of the issues that you have mentioned, the rate of higher education is 27 percent and, and it decreased 20 percent because of the expats. And you have mentioned the reason that the expats have no uh, uh, degrees uh, enabling them to be part of the universities. I'm talking about the universities. We find that the conditions behind that uh, it is not allowed for them to enter these colleges. Is it the high rate that is in demand uh, and uh, not really having the same rate as the nationals? You have uh, really differentiated between uh, the girls and the boys and the 3% rate of nationals studying in private universities. I see that 20-year-old uh, children or 20-year-old men and women really have uh, an employment and they get married and they have families afterwards. They have work, they have responsibilities. They cannot really balance between their responsibilities and the work. So it is uh, their family responsibilities and the jobs. So you should find solutions for similar problems so that work would give this person a kind of space and time so that they can balance between both. Khamis Ashariani from the Executive Secretary. Uh, it has been clarified in the conference a very important challenge uh, as to the international branches here and the main branches, main campuses. The main campuses, uh, uh, are they different when it comes to their educational programs than the branches uh, here elsewhere? Have you really compared between these two uh, programs or the initiatives when it comes to the outcome of uh, the branches are different or similar to uh, that uh, of the main campuses in their home country? as to the as to the validation of uh, the for the online degrees uh, we at the Abu Dhabi Educational Council, uh, the validation of the degrees come from the Ministry of Higher Education. This is my own opinion, but there are a number of universities, online universities, that are there in, 
in uh, places where this person haven't really taken any course and have registered through the internet and have taken his or her own uh, degree online. How can we differentiate between this degree and the other degree that you have taken yourself? So this is the dilemma that we are living in at the moment. There is no international standards for the online degrees. But today, uh, what we are saying here is that we should increase the online degrees, and this will increase the access also because we have a large number of uh, students who go to the universities and uh, study in the evenings, for instance, they are physically there in the campus and they study uh, online. We, we encourage this. This will increase the number of uh, nationals who are taking their degrees in Abu Dhabi. We're talking about that. But the quality assurance is of vital importance. And uh, new universities have opened uh, up uh, such as uh, Sheikh Hamdan University and the Ministry of Higher Education have created new uh, levels or new measurements for electronic education in the country. So there is definitely uh, a directive to increase these uh, online degrees and awareness in this uh, concern when it comes to the quality of these uh, uh, universities. We have different uh, questions when it comes to the uh, uh, to the nationals, rate of nationals between, and, uh, between men and women. We have seen uh, uh, huge rates of nationals that uh, really uh, exceed uh, the, uh, the police academy or the army. Uh, the army uh, needs also certification, needs uh, uh, degrees of its own and promotions, definitely. As for the rate of uh, women uh, who are really more than men, I'm talking about here about the nationals who reach the higher education, uh, but our objective is to encourage the students and give them scholarships so that they continue their degrees and higher education degrees. As for the last question, the measurements of evaluation of universities who have opened up branches in Abu Dhabi compared to other universities elsewhere, main campuses elsewhere. Uh, we have uh, no study whatsoever, but we evaluate them uh, compared to uh, the universities that are there today. I know that the universities have increased uh, the uh, condition of acceptance are very high, and they have uh, really this has uh, caused a rise in the acceptance conditions in our local universities. Uh, and they have brought up international standards for acceptance as well. Uh, so this is good. This is a positive impact from the international universities. We are evaluating the current universities compared to those already there in Abu Dhabi. And does it have any value added uh, uh, to these universities? Or its uh, quality will be less than the governmental universities or private universities present in Abu Dhabi University. When it comes to the teachers or the kind of teachings that are there, when we talk about international benchmarking, uh, similar to the, to the project uh, HALO that we have spoken about, they evaluate uh, the uh, outcome of certain specializations, such as civil engineering, compared to other specializations participating in uh, this uh, project, including the three universities participating in this. Uh, perhaps we can really compare to 99 universities all over the world, but it is very difficult definitely to uh, really uh, compare university on its own because uh, this is uh, like the main campus uh, there, the teachers, the kind of teachers that they have the same standards elsewhere. This is according to the condition of the contract signed between other universities and the government itself. Uh, these universities, if it opens uh, uh, branches uh, for itself uh, here, uh, they are really taking care of the reputation they will not open it and uh, disregarding its own reputation. Uh, this is not uh, really uh, conditioned. So we should uh, evaluate these universities and see its uh, own competence and its own uh, level. If it's uh, higher than the, the level found in Abu Dhabi. This is what interests me more than uh, having it reach the international standard within five years. And until now, uh, uh, these universities, we haven't really have uh, graduates. In one promotion, we should see the first product. When we see the first product, I can then uh, compare it with other universities within the country itself.
also important response. Um, I think uh, Abu Dhabi has done quite a good job of selecting the foreign universities to come, that they want to come here. Institutions which will be concerned about their own reputation, um, that are committed to doing a good job in the country, and so on. So I don't think you have too much to worry about, although verification is important. And as you do, keeping, uh, keeping um, uh, evaluating uh, them. The greater problem, not for Abu Dhabi, but for many other places, uh, is the level, the, the kinds of institutions which frequently want to come and set up a branch campus uh, to make money and which are not top class institutions. And you can, among Professor Jason Lane's long list of 200, many of them are not the kind of institutions that you would like to have in your neighborhood. So one has to be quite careful. And many countries, not this one, are not very careful about who they select. Second point, the quality assurance of both online degrees, which has been mentioned, and of branch campuses is also a very serious problem for the accreditors and quality assurance agencies in the United States and elsewhere. We don't know yet how to effectively assess the work of branch campuses of American universities. Mm -hmm. And that's important to us because we have a responsibility under the law to make sure that our accrediting system is accrediting the degrees which are given by American universities, whether they are in the United States or elsewhere. So we're still figuring that out. Similarly, online degrees are quite a significant problem in terms of quality assurance. There are good ones and there are bad ones. And nobody yet has figured out the quality assurance. There is a lot of research from the online degree community which says that overall the quality of results of students in the online programs versus the students in the traditional programs are similar. But the fact that objective analysis is not, not yet very strong is, is, is a challenge. And my final brief point, the question, are branch campus degrees having the same prestige as the home campus degrees? We don't know that yet because they're too new. The universities which are giving these degrees say, yes, of course, because we're similar, the prestige of the degree, whether it's from New York City or Abu Dhabi or Shanghai, they are all NYU degrees and will be seen the same by the broad community of employers and so on. Maybe. We just don't know. Uh, 27% of the nationals who are registered, uh, the 21% if we put the rate of the expats, uh, but 27% compared to the international standards is less, but not less by much. Uh, in Singapore, they have 27%. This is the highest. 27% is not really a small a scale. Uh, those who have higher education degrees, but there are other generations who are living with us from the preschooling generation. They are there. This is a rate with the increase of educational degrees will increase definitely. Thank you. At the end of the day, on your behalf, I would like to thank Professor Oldbach, uh, Dr. Arif, for uh, this uh, uh, good and uh, privileged panel. Thank you for your uh, intervention. Thank you very much.
As for the second panel, the students participating in the next panel, kindly st stay here with uh, the person in charge so that he can speak to you. Thank you. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, may the peace of God be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. First, I would like to welcome you in this final session for this conference. I would like to say that I hope that this session will be a great addition for the previous ones. This panel has a special aspect. It is different from previous ones. Maybe it is special because now we are listening to the voice of reality, the voice of the student. We will meet students university students. Previous sessions focused on universities, on uh, how to, um, how innovation should be in the universities, on knowledge and all these things. Now we are talking to those who are concerned, the stakeholders. The objective that we are all aiming at, whether through this conference or other conferences or through trying to develop our curricula, all of this in order to serve these students because, as we always believe, they are the real investment that we are trying to achieve. So we can at the end of the day, have the best cadre that are able to build this country. I would like to meet my students of higher education in this panel entitled Students' Perspectives on Innovation, Knowledge Production, and the Internationalization of Education. We notice that uh, the title has many parts, innovation, knowledge education, and internationalization of education. All of us, we agree that higher education and research are the main engine for innovation and uh, economic development. It is the main engine also, engine also uh, this internationalization that we talked about today has a meaning. What's the meaning of internationalization? Internationalization is uh, the interaction with the forces of change on the social, economic, uh, and scientific levels that we are witnessing today. That's why we had to import universities so that international universities are not bounded with anything. So the student can transfer from one university to another student to another university while getting a good quality education. The European Union ratified the Bologna agreement in 2010, it is uh, related to the unification of the education system and making the university international so that the student can transfer from one, tra one university to another university without any hindrance. This is what's happening now in the UAE and the previous session, we noticed that the international universities that, are, that the UAE is filled with are participating to this, and we noticed that 81 higher education institutions in the UAE, 
78 of these 81 are private and most of them are uh, also international and foreign universities. Here we are talking about a large number of universities, whether they are, they are governmental, private, or government-funded universities. It is a great pleasure to be among my students today to listen to their experiences and their proposals in order to reach conclusions and recommendations that will benefit them in the future and will benefit the future generations also. Allow me please to ask them to introduce themselves and the university they are enrolled in and the major. We start with the ladies first <laughs> and we have one lady so please start. May the peace of God be upon you. Sayyidah Muhammad Rashid Al-Mahmadi. I am a PhD student in Khalifa University. I graduated with a master's in computer engineering from Khalifa University. Assalamu alaikum. Omar Al-Mahiri, student at the Sharjah American University. I am in double major, mechanical engineering and computer engineering. May the peace of God be upon you. Ahmad Ali Al Marzuki. I'm a student. I actually I graduated from Sorbonne Abu Dhabi and I have a master's degree in international law. Also I have another master's in uh, business. I started now applying or working on my PhD in engineering. As you can see, we have very valuable uh, examples of our students. And uh, they have uh, diverse majors. Maybe Mr. Arif said that the majority of our students uh, are work or are studying business administration. Now, we have a lot more majors and we can discuss why and how the student chooses his major. This question will be asked to all students. How did they choose their major and what were the factors that affected his choice? Allow me to start with uh, Omar. Uh, why I chose this major i was in the i was in high school I li and i used to like physics i chose to major in mechanical engineering as for computer engineering i uh, participated in a certain competition in uh, computers and i was good at it so that's why i chose the two majors also I had a lot of insights about the major from uh, close people to me. For me, I chose computer engineering because it is uh, it is also asked uh, or the, it is needed in the labor market. I didn't have any experience, any information about it, but I chose it because it is demanded in the labor w market. And uh, they used to say that if you major in uh, computer engineering, you will uh, get a well-paid job. So you had, uh, you, you heard about the salary or at school they told you about all of this. Uh, they, you had advisors, of course, uh, they told us about it in uh, school and uh, uh, I can tell you, I I didn't have any background about this field and this field, but I wanted to develop it. In what year, what grade? We want to focus and see whether the student in high school is well prepared to this uh, phase. Well, 
when I was at school, there was there there was no advice about the labor market. They gave us uh, information about all the majors and opened the door for us to apply. But in uh, high school, we didn't know even what was engineering. Of course, we study a lot of general courses, but we had no idea. Maybe now, uh, with the uh, applied uh, technology, the current uh, students know more about it. But uh, we used to study uh, theories. And we used to think that science was not related to reality. Ahmed, what, what do you think? Through your experience, what do you think about that? Uh, the sister here is uh, very clear. It's true in a lot of uh, educational phases. It is hard for the student to choose his academic path. And one of the major hardships that I faced, I studied engineering and I studied law. I didn't want either of them. <laughs> so sometimes the labor market imposes on the student what to major in because the student thinks about his future job. A lot of young people who are in high school, they face such difficulties. And sadly, they don't know what to choose, whether to choose the major that will guarantee you a future job or the major that I like. So I studied engineering and a law in order to get sponsorship and to and later on, I discovered that I like law more than engineering. That's how I got an opportunity through Sorbonne University. They interviewed me. Uh, they um, tested me to know why does an engineering student uh, choose to study law. A lot of engineering laws are based on uh, law. So it is very important uh, for us to know what we like and how to uh, how to choose what major we want. And now, what do you think? Where do you see yourself after this choice? Now, it is hard for me to say. People ask me, what did you major in? Uh, it's hard for me to say whether it is business or engineering or even law. But all of these... Uh, majors gave me more information, more knowledge about a lot of aspects of uh, work, such as I am like a mufti, I know now in all three majors. Now going back to uh, the previous point, if you had uh, the chance to get prepared uh, uh, in the high school through uh, programs, advice, uh, orientation, do you think that uh, you, uh, it was a benefit for you to get more than one major or it's a loss of time? You could have uh, focused on only one major. Do you think this was your experience was positive or negative because you didn't have the opportunity, this opportunity to choose in previous phases of your education? My experience was positive, in my opinion. Uh, schools uh, later, uh, schools uh, used to have a different role. As for now, the education, uh, the Abu Dhabi Education Council has a lot of roles to play in this uh, regard, and there's technology. Now they have more tools to choose and to know. Can I add one thing? As you already said, I was in high school and I participated in programming uh, competitions and this helped me choose my uh, major. But I met a lot of people in the university. They did not have such an opportunity and they were really, they felt really bad uh, and they, 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 they regretted choosing the major they chose. So Omar gave us a very important uh, comment, the activities how to participate in uh, extracurricular 
activities? How can they affect your choice of major? It is considered, of course, a factor that enriches the capacities of the student to choose his major. So I think that uh, the ministry focuses, uh, should focus on this part of the study. So uh, my students are in uh, private universities or uh, semi-governmental universities such as Khalifa University, all of them are private. And uh, we are talking, we talked about the internationalization of uh, education or universities or branches. I just want them to give me their opinions about that. Omar, please tell me what do you think about the international University. Uh, of course, there are benefits. I want you to cite for me a few benefits. The American University of Sharjah has students from all the parts of the world. So this enriches our culture and um, the dialogue between cultures. And I think that we have good doctors that are uh, well-rounded, and uh, this helps the university to build engineers that can benefit their society and their economy and their workspace. Okay, it's hard. Uh, you studied in a governmental university and then in Khalifa University, first of all, in the UAE uh, University, and now the Khalifa University. So how? Do you, what, what do you think about the educational environment? The Emirates University, as they say, uh, accepts around 8,000 8, university uh, a year. So I didn't feel I was special in Khalifa University. It's a small university. They accept around three, 300 uh, students every year and they focus on our projects. So if I prepare a project, they would publish it. This is a very good opportunity. They give us a lot of opportunities in order to become presenters of our papers and they encourage us to publish our journals. This is a very important opportunity. I had a great opportunity to publish five journals. Uh, until now, I received an award, uh, the Best Paper Award also. And this is a great encouragement for me, especially in research field, when we can uh, prepare new things uh, and uh, participate in international comp competitions. So I liked the international university in terms of the opportunities they give us. Ahmad, uh, you studied at uh, Sorbonne University and uh, the Technical uh, Academy also. Let's talk about the Sorbonne University. It is the lighthouse the f of Abu Dhabi. It is also a bridge between cultures. It is a very unique uh, experience to study in the French system, to deal with French professors. It's a lot different than the system we got used to in our universities. It is an opportunity for many students, especially those who want to enroll in Sorbonne, they will learn more about the French system, the French culture, and this is a great opportunity. Great. Omar said that uh, the culture dialogue, but in the previous session, they talked about cultural clashes, which is the opposite. So do we think this is a challenge that can face our students, especially Emirati ones in such international universities? Now we are talking about uh, the preparation of the student in international uh, views. But at the same time, we want a student that uh, cares for his national culture and identity. How do, you see this, how do you see this challenge through 
being enrolled in such international universities? I'll start with Ahmad. I think uh, that the uh, cultural variety in the UAE, we have so many nationalities, enables us to deal with the different cultures that melt into each other. But according to my experience at Sorbonne University, we have uh, established a group for Estidama, for sustainability. We, this group uh, encourages practices, uh, uh, practices regarding uh, sustainable development in the UAE, especially in Abu Dhabi. We have created a tent under the dome of the French Sorbonne. And we started explaining to the French people and to uh, uh, the uh, to the students uh, the Emirati culture. Our culture today has become uh, a, a desire for several uh, people. They want to learn about us. They want to know more. I don't see a problem in that. I don't see at all a problem in that. Perhaps, let us see what Omar has to say. Perhaps uh, Omar has lived most of his life outside of the country, knowing that uh, uh, his father was out of the country. He learned the English language before the Arabic language, but I was really happy when I saw him talking the Arabic language because some of our students, knowing that they have gotten used to speak the English language, it's hard for them to speak the Arabic language. Omar is studying at uh, the American University. I'm sure he speaks English more than the Arabic language. Uh, knowing that you have a problem in the language, how do you preserve uh, your languages? I think you can if you try. Of course, there is there is a cultural clash. I think uh, that you find these uh, problems in uh, in the university, but. Uh, there is a difficulty definitely uh, to uh, retain one's own language and culture because we have so many different cultures and languages uh, around us. And I'm managing, you can say that uh, everything is uh, ongoing, I'm managing. Of course, we have uh, activities, we have students coming from abroad, they want to learn the Arabic language at university, and uh, uh, I think this is important. So the Arabic language, you learn it from the students at the university or from the school? From the school. So you're practicing, you try to practice the Arabic language at university? Yes, I try. I try to practice it at university, definitely. But it is an American university, so it's really hard for us to practice the Arabic uh, language. Uh, all the sessions and lectures are in the English language. But I think that the Emirati students should uh, really focus on this objective. This is your own language. We don't want to uh, to have students who acquire the English language. We want that definitely for the demands of life and the labor work. But at the same time, we want uh, the Emirati uh, student uh, to uh, to acquire the mother tongue language, we want them to be to acquire both languages, but the mother tongue is the priority, definitely. How do you look into the training programs? We are talking now about these universities and uh, to what extent they exist with the demands of the labor market. How do you prepare the student to the labor market? This is of vital importance, definitely. And I think that you have all said that the university or this specialization is important and how you prepare yourselves to the labor market. This is what uh, you know pushed you to choose the university. I'm talking about Khalifa University. <clears throat> we have the new research center and EPTEC and Ankabut. During the master's period, uh, of course, we have uh, specialized majors. We are working with uh, the industrial people, not only academic people. So after we finish, everything is ready for us 
to start uh, uh, to implement what we have learned in the companies, for instance, Aptec and Ankabut, we have them at Khalifa University. The same applies with the theoretical or the practical side. Aptec really provides us with electronic machinery, everything we need. We are communicating with them. We are learning twice per week. Uh, we have uh, students who are specialized in electronic uh, uh, sites, so they use the machines that Aptec provide and uh, the facilities, and uh, they allow the student to work on projects that they use in the industry itself. So stuff that uh, the labor market needs, and you benefit from that, right? Of course we are. We have really uh, interacted with people in this industry. So we are prepared to take to work with them directly. I have been chosen between continuing my PhD or work. I chose the PhD definitely, but I will need them for research and other uh, issues. We have our research centers. Thank you for your decision. You were at Sorbonne University. In the previous session, we have spoken of the student exchange students. Did we? Did you have that at Sorbonne? We are talking about this distinguished French university and this branch in the UAE. Of course, Dr. Fatma can benefit you uh, in answering this question. You have really been part in the program, student exchange program. No, I don't know of this uh, issue, but uh, I knew I know that there were efforts exerted uh, to exchange students uh, and the teachers from universities in Latin America. And some of the workers inside the university used to work on that. What about the American University? What about the student exchange programs? Yes, we have. We have 20 students this year who went abroad, and the same number came to us. No, I did not really been part of that. We have students, definitely, and I was part of the... The group uh, uh, responsible for organizing this uh, student exchange program. And they have benefited definitely. You are graduating this year. So how do you see after these five years? How do you see? Uh, are you ready? You will be graduating this year. Are you ready for life, for the labor market? I have learned a lot, uh, theoretically. But when I reached last year, graduating year, we started really focusing on the practical things. Personally, I feel that I am uh, ready, but other students used to reach last year. Now they started focusing on practical things, and they have uh, forgotten the theoretical uh, things. I think that teaching or education in the university should be focusing on practical and theoretical at the same time so that the student might really understand the value of what he was been taught all these years and to use what he has been uh, uh, taught during the lectures, even in the uh, way of thinking. So I am an engineer, so I, n I can speak to you about that. Through the previous sessions, we have uh, we have seen that the number of students at universities is very low compared to other uh, countries. What do you think the problem uh, is, and the reason behind that? Perhaps uh, the number of girls are more than the number of boys uh, uh, at universities. What is the reason behind that, in your opinion? What is the challenge uh, rising here? Perhaps you talk about that with your friends. 
I have uh, done my master's tackling a very important issue, which is to solve the problem of this huge gap between the literary students and the scientific students. I uh, More than 1,000 uh, students participated in, in a survey that I did myself, and they said that, that the most important reason behind not being part of scientific uh, uh, education is the English language and the teacher. The students, when they apply to universities, they don't uh, succeed uh, in uh, the islets and the TOEFL. So they uh, really uh, go uh, um, uh, or, or apply as a freshman and they change their uh, major. I have really conducted an interview with students in the army. They said uh, um, had uh, had engineering and other scientific uh, uh, subjects uh, been taught in Arabic. We would have really been part of that. So I have really analyzed my results of the survey and the results of the private schools and universities. They complained of the English language. They really are weak in the English language, and therefore they couldn't uh, really uh, feel part of uh, this uh, system. And unfortunately, I, I did not learn the English language for 12 years. They only taught us to, to uh, memorize what we we have to write the second day. So um, we got used to getting uh, or memorizing everything. I see my sisters the same uh, happening. They memorize a day before of the exam what they want to write, and this is uh, wrong. We haven't learned a thing. This is the reason behind that. I agree with you, Suhaila. Because indeed, our educational system, especially the governmental system, uh, still needs development. And I think that this is what uh, called on the uh, ministry to uh, to s study all over again uh, the, and how can the, the school change itself where the student or uh, this uh, gap between uh, scholastic and university education would be through strengthening the subject at school, especially if uh, it were uh, the English language. There were several attempts at the Ministry of Education, uh, the al ghad schools, and other uh, attempts, definitely. And hopefully, uh, this will solve this problem. But those uh, who uh, who passed through this problem can really explain to us uh, the challenge. Uh, they have uh, really experienced that. Uh, they have high uh, rates, and they are not really been uh, being accepted at the university due to the TOEFL and the uh, weakness in the English language. I think we don't have much time, but I want to hear from uh, uh, the students. Uh, to give me one last word they want to say. And we haven't really spoken about that. We wanted through this discussion to focus on several issues. But I want to give them the word now, the floor, to say whatever they want to say. If they want to add something, to open the floor for further questions. I would like uh, to thank the organizers of this uh, conference, the future of education in the UAE. I would like to remind you that education is not uh, what we are acquiring in the university. We have learned a lot, definitely, and it is our Emirati culture. We have a lot to learn, and uh, education uh, outside of the campus of the university is much more than inside. So we do not, uh, we uh, don't uh, really uh, s uh, think it is sufficient to learn inside the university, but also outside. I want to focus only on uh, the English language. We have moved from governmental uh, schools to universities that teach uh, English uh, uh, language in all the subject. This is the challenge. We moved from the Arabic language to the English, uh, English language. This is the best 
solution I think I have really uh, compared between other universities in California and uh, uh, and other universities that really uh, learn the subject in other than the mother tongue but we should start in a very early age they have applied the system and they saw that they had very positive uh, results after implementing these subjects, which is the integration. I think Abu Dhabi Educational Council has a clear-cut uh, vision and plan about that. At the moment, when they say that the presentation is in Arabic, you feel something else in Arabic. It's easy, but in the English, it's an effort, a huge effort exerting to uh, translate and make sure that our, our, our translation is right. If we had a good basics in English, at the same time in the Arab in the Arabic language, we will have very uh, good and positive results, uh, especially uh, the uh, school, uh, governmental schools. At school, you usually see uh, that the classes or the teachers give them projects, writing uh, reports. Uh, usually, they copy from the internet. These projects um, are not practical whatsoever, and they don't need thinking. So if they implement during the studies of mathematics and other scientific subjects, if they have projects to make the student think in a solution using what he has been taught at school, this makes him understand further the subject matter. And afterwards, he might really apply to engineering or architecture and so on. We have uh, seen examples at yesterday's presentation, students that participate and contributed in beneficial subjects, uh, things that uh, should be implemented and applied on the ground. This benefits us, definitely. I think that the students have uh, designed or drawn a very clear picture how they were in their school life, in their university lives, and what are the challenges that they faced, what are uh, their desires and their aspirations to uh, overcome these challenges, and how we can prepare them to prepare the student in a much better way, whether for the labor market or for life in society and to contribute or participate in the building of the society. At the end of the day, I would like to thank, thank them. And I was really very happy being here with you to hear what they have to say. Hopefully, our work for them and with them, our work would be beneficial to achieve our objective, our educational system completely. I don't know if you open the floor, pave the way for further questions. Go ahead. Ahmed Al Bastaki, I'm really happy attend this meeting and to hear what our students have to say. Knowing that we have field experiences in this respect, I'd like to hear your answer after you pass through these experiences. How, how do you want to have, uh, what kind of educational plan you want to have for your children? Your generation is young. And uh, we are talking about the future of education in the UAE. We want to hear from you, yourselves. Um, uh, how do you want the future of education to be for your children? In the name of God Almighty, the most gracious, the most merciful, Dr. Akhulwud al-Mansouri. My intervention today is the following. I'm very glad to have them, to have the students uh, here with us. We are all here for them, students in universities and schools. 
and for them to be part of the lectures, this is important. Due to my knowledge and experience in dealing with the students at schools and at universities, I am in pain, definitely, to see uh, very senior students to uh, have this uh, lack of knowledge of what they want to do in the future. They don't know what they want to, to do. Uh, they don't know what, uh, why they, uh, you know, uh, applied to the literary field or scientific field. Uh, they don't know why they find their friends going into literary. They go. They follow them. That's it. They don't really, really are interested. We need. Uh, professional and academic guidance for the universities. Uh, we notice that uh, the student who wait one or two years to enter the university in Sharjah, the, stu the student uh, cannot really start the university years. He needs foundation. Uh, this is about 77%. They are not really aware of the importance of the English language in their lives and the islets and so on. And there's a culture against this. So the lack of awareness vis-a-vis uh, -vis the importance of the language as a part of our lives. It's a minimum language. The least you could do is to read and write. They don't know that. They don't know that. They say that we are imposing the English language. I tried so much with the students with, with dialogue. I tell them, you are a student. You should know how to move yourself forward. The Ministry of Education, higher education, should be responsible of this guidance from 10-year-old and 11-year-old. They should guide them to know what they want to do in the future. Yes, this is what Suhaila has focused on. We are dealing with that and suffering from that. The ministry should focus on that. Thank you very much. Go on. I would like to welcome you all. You talked a lot today about the Ministry of Education and the minister will hold long meetings to review every word you said. I'll give you an example. Some uh, students finish with their master's degrees and they are And for example, Mr. Ahmad here has uh, a lot of majors, and we'll call him Ibn Sina of the students. So, okay, uh, the lecturer that used to deal with you and uh, the course that he used to teach, can you compare between the two? Do you think that there was an agreement between the uh, type of uh, lectures you used to deal with, with also the uh, materials. I don't know if you will be able to answer my question. This needs a, a whole session. Uh, in the front, you in the front. Go on. thank very much the three young people um, because you are part of the leadership of tomorrow in the UAE in your field of endeavor. I have a couple of comments um, on the points made by the different people and first Ahmed as an undergraduate I couldn't decide between writing poetry and chemistry and took both and there it was an enormous asset to my career because even though I chose chemistry creative writing and literature helped not only my appreciation of the arts but helped me write excellent quality papers reviews in my field of endeavor and you might be interested to know the reason I chose chemistry 
was purely pragmatic because I came from a very poor family and getting a job in chemistry would be much easier than trying to be a successful poet. The prospects for high income as a poet were much, much less. Uh, so bravo for doing that, law and engineering, because it will benefit you throughout your career. Second, your comment, science not related to reality, is alarming, actually. Not, not a criticism of you, but what you heard. Because that tells me there is a lack of appreciation of the value of science technology. And yet, S and T are key to your health, your well-being, your economic success, and societal advancement. And so I think there needs to be better mentorship by guidance counselors in the school system, much better mentorship. And also the development in the UAE of a science culture. Science literacy is very important because if you want to build a capability in science technology, you have to do certain things such as uh, what I mentioned, you also have to create academy. They become the soul of the nation. That's important in the governance stru uh, structure. And last, language. I come from a country that is bilingual, French and English, from a university that is bilingual. And the motto is, English or French, the choice is yours. You can take any subject in either language. And that's very valuable. And so teaching, if, if I grow up basically as a child of English-speaking parents, I start learning French in kindergarten throughout. And having high-quality teachers is crucial to success. And like it or not, science, engineering, et cetera, globally it works in English. That's why Japanese learn in English. In science and engineering. Brazilians learn in English. Thank you. So, okay? Thank you. So I'll take the two questions, one after the other. And I'm from Emirates College for Advanced Education. My question is for the, is for the three of you. Um, we're always looking at new assignments and new assessments, and could you each tell us about one really interesting assignment and why you liked it, why you think it was profe uh, professionally beneficial? Again, please. Could each of you tell us uh, one interesting um, university assignment or assessment that you had, one project that you had in one of your courses, and could you explain why you really liked it and why it might be professionally or personally very beneficial. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Zainab al Hamadi. Zainab al Hamadi from Khalifa University. I would like to talk about two main points. First, uh, the, the curriculum. Uh, uh, curricular and extracurricular training. I am a student, uh, first year university student. I graduated from a governmental school and I was late to start with my university studies because I wasn't uh, really aware about the major that I wanted to adopt, uh, whether it would be chemical, uh, biological, or uh, mechanical engineering. So I went towards training. But in the first year, it seems that most of the uh, industries uh, uh, only take uh, graduate, only take uh, trainees from the fourth year, not from the first. So I think it is very important uh, to have extracurricular training, whether it is uh, for the first year of university or the high school, or and to give the students the opportunity to take the training and choose 
based on the training what they want to major and I was confused whether to choose engineering uh, uh, mechanical or chemical engineering but after the training it became all clear uh, I have a another problem related to the English language and uh, to its teaching it is a big difference between um, learning uh, the sciences in Arabic in school and then learning it in English in the university, and this is really hard. It seems that the uh, teachers are not capable of teaching us the English language because they used to teach us this language only as a dialogue, only to speak in it. So. It is very important not to repeat this experience so that the students will not be shocked with the English language in university. So they need to know whether to go uh, to a private or a governmental school and then uh, it's where to go for the university. So we will start answering the questions. First question was general, it was addressed to everyone. What do you wish, what do you hope that your children will get uh, in terms of education? What did you miss and what do you want them not to miss? Maybe the application of education on the practical level. We take four courses every week. It's better to have two theoretical and two practical courses. So after the theory, there should be uh, the practical aspect of the course. As she said, the practical aspect of the course need to uh, go in parallel with the theoretical aspect of the course. Everything we learn in the university and school is very important, but as they already said, there's a lack in uh, on the practical level. So I think you will give us all the same answer because this is what you felt you missed as students. But if we talk about what we wish for, the uh, checklist will be really long. Dr. Khulu talked about uh, technical guidance. And she talked about it through its interviews with students. We can say that the guidance doesn't only have to be in high school, but in every single uh, phase. So this can be academic or even more or uh, uh, we, we can say that ever since the students taught at school, they need to be guided and uh, they need to take into consideration its needs, its uh, psychological needs, and also uh, its, uh, its need in turn, in, ter in term to take a decision whether to choose uh, the uh, scientific field or the arts and literature field. So they need to know what to choose. The process of taking this decision is very important. We need to encourage not only our students, but also our sons and daughters at home how to take the decision and how to be responsible for the decision and assume the responsibility for its repercussions. So if we develop the personality of the student, he will grow up to be capable of taking decisions. The question about the evaluation of lecturers and uh, uh, scientific courses, you asked us to give a grade from on a scale of 1 to 10. I don't think they can answer, but let me uh, rephrase the question. Do you had really remarkable uh, lecturers that uh, you still remember? This is a very hard question. We got used to them evaluating us. I am talking about Sorbonne University in Abu Dhabi. So in Sorbonne University, a lot of lecturers, the majority of which are French, 
they have uh, long-term experience and they are excellent. But maybe the problem that we used to face was on the language level. We studied uh, during our master's degree in English and now it is French. But this problem had also a silver lining. We started to learn some terms in French, legal terms. And the our education students are uh, not similar to school edu uh, students. So they are expected to conduct researches, to uh, get deeper information. So I think all of the, uh, my teachers uh, who taught me, I give them 10 over 10. Uh, as he already said, uh, if the teacher is better, we don't benefit from him a lot because So they uh, they focus on research, and this is very important. We ha you do have doctors uh, who are like um, not like that. They had uh, uh, doctors that uh, foreign doctors, and they are really good. And we didn't choose to uh, benefit from them. As for other doctors that graduated from our university, from Arab universities, they were more beneficial to us. All doctors uh, who work at our university, they are they have a high understanding of their work uh, but i have i have few comments about the way of teaching so they used to explain the basics but they leave leave uh, the uh, student to find a deeper information and wider information they would give us a project and they ask us to study more things in comparison to what we study in class So this would push the student to find its own way and deploy his own efforts to get more information. There was a question there about uh, uh, summer training and uh, it was a proposal from Zainab, Zainab Al-Hamadi. She proposed uh, summer training uh, during uh, school in order to prepare the student for university. Uh, so you worked on such a project and it was your uh, your, res your graduation research. What do you think? I saw that uh, in other countries they had uh, summer camps students from the ninth grade till the 12th grade, they would send them uh, to summer camps in order to train for uh, engineering and other fields. So they have a broad idea about the major they can choose from. So even NASA would take uh, students and they will ask them to prepare projects and this is very important and very successful way to train. In my experience, I think that uh, summer training is very important and I benefit from it greatly. So uh, I disagree that the student has to take a training once in his lifetime during university if they would uh, visit uh, companies and work for them for like a week or so, this will benefit the students because he will become really aware of what is asked from him. I think that we all agree about uh, what they are saying. And uh, of course, this is uh, the words are stemming from the heart because we really need that. And uh, it is from experience that we are talking. Uh, more questions? I don't know about the time. Please be brief. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Khaled Abdullah, I would like to ask the students, Omar, Suhaila, and Ahmad, if you had to do it all over again, what would you graduate in? 
No, if they go back in time, not not what they have, what to what, uh, what degree they have. If they go back in time, what would they choose? So, what do you advise us for the coming generations? What would you major in if you go back in time? The same major. Of course, Ahmad, you cannot answer because you tried more than one major. So don't tell me it's another thing you're going to choose. I cannot say I want to be a poet, but this is a hobby. It could be a hobby. No, I am saying that if I go back in time, maybe I would major in agriculture. This is something. You still have time, Ahmad. You still have time. I cannot change anything. Perhaps I might add a third specialization. God bless you. What about the advice for the teacher? No, our brother. I have comment. Uh, of course, my uh, brothers, the teachers, the teacher is a messenger, in my opinion. This is an Arabic proverb. Perhaps uh, my colleagues are younger than me. Uh, I used to go to my father, my father, and I used to tell my uh, father, the teacher uh, has, uh, has hit me. Uh, uh, my teachers ask of you one thing, just to feel with us. If the teacher can build a relationship with the student, whether at school or outside school, a relationship between student and teacher, not when it comes only to teaching, uh, but as a friend. My wife is a teacher, and she has a very strong relationship. And she's here. She's listening to us. Uh, she has a relationship with all the teachers. They communicate with her a lot. Uh, this relationship is ongoing, the, the students feel that she is their mother. So I hope our teachers try as much as possible to really gain the student. Uh, this is what we lacked in our days. Thank you. In the name of God Almighty, the most gracious, the most merciful, I'm from Oman, the Ministry of Fire Education. Thank you for your, uh, for inviting us. We have benefited a lot. I have an intervention as to the difficulty faced by the students prior uh, entering uh, the university. Perhaps uh, the Ministry of, um, uh, of Higher Education has uh, created uh, the vocational uh, guidance department uh, students uh, start or teachers start from the 10th grade to facilitate between the capabilities of the student and the specialization they need, medical or engineering. They are uh, scientific uh, subject matters. They try to encourage students to, uh, to excel in these uh, subjects and they tell them what do they need for that. This has facilitated a lot of uh, students and helped them a lot in that respect. Thank you. My name is Asma Khalid from uh, Emirates uh, College of Educational Development. Uh, I will graduate this year. You spoke about uh, 
the, the students at school, uh, how can he apply to the specialization he wants? Uh, uh, the student uh, in the baccalaureate, why uh, doesn't he qualify to continue his studies uh, in the future? I want to continue my studies after the bac uh, baccalaureate, but till now I don't know what to choose. Can I change my specialization? So I'm not ready for that. And I have also a comment, uh, since we are the future teachers, teachers of the future, uh, through the training that we got, I felt that the students, when we teach them in English, they go out of the uh, class as a translator for what we are saying, not as understanding for what we are saying. They acquire new words, vocabulary, and not really benefiting from the English. Uh, class. Guidance at school for specialization after the higher education. I have no uh, answer. I am facing the same problem. So I don't know what to do at a later stage, the new specialization after graduating. I have no answer. As for the translation, yes, I've seen similar students. They are weak in English. They have the same problem. They should translate what they have heard to their mother tongue language. And I have no solution also to that. So we're talking about academic guidance. From what level to what level? Does this mean that our students need, even after graduating from university, to guidance to choose uh, their own PhD, for instance? This is a valid question. You have talked eloquently and much about your own studies and your relationship with your teachers. I would be interested to know how your fellow students have supported your learning and challenged you, and whether f students themselves could be harnessed more to provide some of the enrichment and, and solutions to things that you've been talking about. In the name of God Almighty, the most gracious, the most uh, merciful physics uh, teacher at Al Ain, I waited for someone to defend the Ministry of Higher Education, especially the governmental school, uh, but apparently not. Uh, I'm a major in physics, not Arabic language. I'm talking about uh, the students. What you have spoke of is uh, or emanates from your own needs, but we don't uh, really. Uh, a lesson uh, from the impact of the products of governmental schools only in the English language. I have some of the cases, students uh, move from private schools to governmental schools and they succeed in English language, but uh, the level, their levels in uh, physics, biology, mathematics, the mother tongue will remain the mother tongue. I have studied the English language and uh, we, uh, I don't expect you to dream of the English language unless you have started with the English language as long as the mother tongue is the Arabic language as Ahmad uh, did. He wanted to be a poet. Uh, he, st uh, he studied uh, French, but uh, he will be a poet in the Arabic language, not in the French language. Whether in the dialogues of the students in my dialogue, we haven't really lessened the role of the Ministry of Higher Education, and we haven't really focused on the English language. But this is a problem that they have suffered of, and now the Ministry of Higher Education is working on uh, finding solutions about that. Whether Abu Dhabi Educational Council or the Ministry of Higher Education, all the institutions related to educational institutions, we haven't really spoken about the, the students and his readiness uh, or his or her readiness uh, to uh, be part of the university. This is clear. We have spoken about that. Uh, I am. Uh, I was a principal of a governmental school, and I'm still proud of the governmental schools and the impact and the outcome of the governmental schools. But if there is a, a gap, we should say there is a gap, and we should really consider that. 
uh, the experiences and the uh, problematic that occur due to this reason, the conditions of the higher education, Mr. of higher education to accept students. For instance, I am a Jordanian. My uh, daughter uh, studied uh, here. She was the first uh, ranking, the first uh, in the UAE. When she goes to Jordan to study medicine, she uh, she is studying in English two or three months of practice in English, uh, and this is different. Uh, so uh, the student Ahmad is, agrees with me definitely. We apologize uh, for uh, not taking further questions because there's no time whatsoever. And uh, once again, thank you. I would like to thank m the students. I enjoyed it personally. I enjoyed their discussions, their your interventions. Hopefully everyone uh, have benefited. Thank you for the organizers of the conference. Thank you for your presence. Kindly uh, stay seated for the f concluding remarks of the conference. Thank you. Um, and there's a briefing of uh, the Office of Scholarships. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fatima al -Mariq. Thank you for the students, for this privileged session. We are always proud that the ECSSR uh, of our students in all fields. After we have, uh, we have been introduced to our students, there is a very privileged uh, institution. It is one of the initiatives that have participated or that the ECSSR has participated in it. The initiative of the Office of Coordinating Scholarships or Missions um, at the Presidential Affairs Ministry. It is a pioneering uh, office. Uh, it was established in the year 1999. Dr. Ali Al the uh, chairman of the office, will give us a briefing about the objectives of this office and the accomplishments that have been achieved since the establishment of the office until the year 1917. Thank you, Ahmad. Good morning. Of course, in continuation of the previous uh, session, the students inside the country, to respect the students inside the country and outside the country. Uh, we haven't been really a part of the program. Uh, Dr. Jamal, uh, God bless him, has given us this opportunity to speak of the office. Students outside of the country, what is the role of the office to refuse or to send our graduates to the most important 25 universities all over the world? for the knowledge-based economy. But before giving you a small presentation, I have a small movie about the office. وحن 
من الطلبة الإماراتيين ومنحهم فرصة تعليمية مثالية من خلال ابتعاثهم لدراسة تخصصات متنوعة تتواءم في جوهرها مع احتياجات سوق العمل تم التقائي مكتب البعثات لابتعاث الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وكان صراحة شرف لأنها بعثة تحمل اسم صاحب السمو رئيس الدولة ومسؤولية بعد على عاتقي يعني أن لازم أشرف اسم البعثة الحمد لله دخلت جامعة كين ميري اللي تعتبر من أعرق الجامعات في بريطانيا وقدرت أتخصص في طب الأسنان بحيث أقدر أن لما أرجع البلاد أطبقها وأساهم لو جزء بسيط في رفعة البلاد على الأقل من الناحية الطبية يعني I was very lucky being at Harvard because that was the only school where I got to have a studio. And so that's where I got to do all this practical work and be very hands-on. So coming back over here, I already was into that vibe and motion uh, where I could practice everything that I was learning. Alhamdulillah, I chose the University of Iowa State University, which is one of the best 10 universities in the field of computer science. And they brought us teachers from big companies, from Microsoft, from Oracle, from Java. وهذا بروحه كان كانت استفاده من خبرتهم كبيره جدا. تجربتي ودراستي في في جامعه دوك نقطه بدايه للتعرف ونزيد من الخبرات والتطوير النفسي في في المجال علوم الكمبيوتر. تجربتي في دراسه القانون في بريطانيا كانت تجربه جدا ممتعه. تعرفت فيها على ثقافه جديده، كونت فيها صداقات من جنسيات مختلفه، اشرف على دراستي اكبر الاساتذه في مجال تخصصي. أنا انضميت بجامعة إمري ريدل للطيران والحمد لله ساعدتني على كسب الخبرة المطلوبة للانضمام للطيران الاتحاد وحاليا أنا مساعد طيار على الإيرباص من الأشياء الصعبة اللي اللي عانيت فيها في بداية دراستي في في أمريكا كانت أول شيء التعرف على ثقافات الدول الثانية خاصة الأمريكان يعني وأيضا اللغة كانت كانت من الأشياء الصعبة عندي في البداية مثل أي طالب مبتعث واجهتني صعوبات في أول سنة يمكن أبرزها البعد عن الأهل والوطن يقوم مكتب البعثات الدراسية بسلسلة من الجهود لتحقيق أهدافه الاستراتيجية في مجال الابتعاث الدراسي كما يسهم في توفير الإرشاد الأكاديمي للطلبة ومتابعتهم بشكل دوري خلال فترة الدراسة كما يحظى الطلبة ببرامج تدريبية مكثفة تؤهلهم للالتحاق بجهات العمل والمؤسسات التي ينضمون إليها بعد التخرج وفعلاً كانوا حتى الجماعة من المكتب على قدر المسؤولية من الصوب الثاني كان دعمهم المادي ودعمهم المعنوي وكان متابعتهم الأكاديمية لي متابعة دقيقة وممتازة كانوا بمثابة سكند أدفايزر كان عندنا أدفايزر في الجامعة لكن دوم كانوا يتصلون بنا ويتواصلون معانا وأي مشكلة تصادفنا في الإدارة في الجامعة هم يروحون ويحلونها مش إحنا ساعدونا أنا وكل الطلبة المبتعثين زملائي في التخطي على المشاكل والصعوبات اللي واجهتنا يلتحق الطلبة الخريجون بمؤسسات وجهات عمل حيوية وبفضل تكوينهم العلمي المتكامل أصبحوا مثار الاهتمام ومحل إشادة الكثيرين بعثة لازم تكون عندها دراية سوق العمل محتاجة سوق العمل من الأسباب اللي خلتني أتخصص مالية في في ميشيغان ستيت يونيفرستي إن لما أرجع هنا أشتغل في مجال الاستثمار فكان لي بعثة صاحب اسمه رئيس الدولة الفضل كبير إني أتوظف في مبادلة في بداية عملي في في مصدر كنت ماسك مشاريع كثير لها اختصاص في 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 هذا المجال إدارة المعلومات وكان طبعا هاي الخبرة اللي اكتسبتها في في دراستي مهمة جدا وخلتني أقدر أأدي هاي المشاريع وتمهم بنجاح الحمد لله أنا اليوم أشتغل كمستشارة قانونية في مؤسسة الإمارات للطاقة النووية وهذه من أهم المؤسسات في الإمارات بعد التخرج التحقت بوزارة الشؤون الرئاسة وكان عندي باشن رغبة صراحة في أني أطبق ما تعلمته واليوم وبعد عقد من الزمن يسعى مكتب البعثات الدراسية عبر رؤى طموحة مواكبة للتحديات التنموية التي يشهدها العالم لصناعة روافد علمية جديدة وفق مبادرات استراتيجية تضمن ريادة وسبقا في مجال البعثات الدراسية أوجه رسالة لجميع شباب وشابات الإمارات من المتميزين علميا بالالتحاق بمكتب البعثات يكونون على أتم ثقة 
ان المكتب يوفر لهم الدعم المتواصل بالانضمام لجامعات متميزه لتحسين مستقبلهم المهني وهي اسمها بحثت على الدوله للطلاب المتميزين لان اسمها بروحه فخر اشكر صاحب السمو رئيس الدوله والشيخ منصور بن زايد النهيان على دعمهم اللامحدود للطلبه والطالبات الاماراتيين المتميزين علميا ولاتاحه الفرصه لهم للالتحاق بارقى الجامعات العالميه الرجال هي اللي تصنع تصنع المصانع الرجال هي اللي تصنع سعادته الرجال هي اللي تصنع حياته الرجال اللي هي تصنع حاضرها ومستقبلها Before I start the presentation, allow me it was his own idea since 1999 he has established that objectives of the scholarships office to send elite uh, students uh, in all these scientific fields uh, to develop human capital, to acquire the most important knowledges and uh, skills. So the office established 1999 under the supervision of Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed directly. Uh, The uh, board of directors, uh, Dr. Shamal is the head of the board of directors, as I said, since 1999 until now. He is uh, helping us. Um, thank you, Dr. The board of directors is handling from choosing the students, following up, defining uh, the universities and the specializations, but the up issue of ch choice. People think that it is the office that chooses the specializations. Uh, the board of directors really uh, are busy in their uh, lives, but we Sometimes we sit for hours and for weeks just to uh, choose the best of the best of the elite students, academic students. I'm talking about 90 at school and above, 95 and above, or 97. The number of graduates until now. 185, the number of students now, 277, the graduates of higher education, no, I'm not talking about the baccalaureate, also PhD and masters. We have a doctor who is working on his post doctorate about strings theory. We have in Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford, he has uh, given lectures. He is the graduate of a governmental school. Our students are uh, elitists and innovative. They found uh, a place to benefit uh, from their own uh, from their own work. I know you are busy. Uh, I shall talk uh, quickly. Uh, the student should have high grades, uh, should be uh, local. So the number that we have, we have 700 students, for instance. We choose out of the 700, about 40 or 50 students. We have a long process to choose the best of the best to acquire experience outside, and then they come back and benefit. I think that if Dr. Yahya al marzuki and other students as well have benefited from that, uh, even uh, from governmental schools and the private institutions, uh, 
they have acquired the experience, and I'm proud to say that they have really studies and got their diplomas. But they know from the beginning the uh, objective of this from the start. They know why they have gone to Harvard and MIT, why uh, they have gone to Iowa State, best engineering uh, university all over the world, Wisconsin, and so on and so forth. You can't believe uh, uh, there are so many institutions that are sending their students to our office to be chosen as part of the scholarships office uh, mission. There is a personal interview by the board of directors uh, to sign uh, a contract to work and to come back and work in a governmental institution, for instance, to be committed uh, to uh, their work at the board of directors, they have written a system of scholarships since 1999. I am a graduate of the scholarships office and higher education. Most of the people present here were graduates of this office. Perhaps they might change that uh, their specializations. No one knows, but starting 1999, everything has changed only at the scholarships office. But with my experience and my follow up with the parties and institutions that are sending their, their uh, students, they have changed their work, their style of work, because they found out that uh, the experience of the scholarships office and the best work is to be part, to follow up the student, to, to put conditions. You have a 3.0 GPA. So there are a lot of conditions. In addition, we have incentives. The scholarships. I used to give $2,000, and they used to give 6000 uh, 6, etc. Okay, so what would they do? They used to do that in order to give the students incentives to only worry about studying, not about the rent, etc. They wanted them to worry only about getting a really good results and experience. So our role was choosing the students, uh, helping him benefit from studying outside the country. Of course, uh, the decision uh, starts or takes place in the third month of the year. The, the, you talked about problems uh, of lack of guidance, etc., especially in governmental schools and even in private schools. In two, three weeks, we, you, we will hold a co the college knowledge forum for uh, those who are responsible of guidance and orientation in private schools. Some of them do not know how to write recommendation letters. So we teach them. We don't have a problem. We help those people responsible for guidance in schools. We raise their awareness on such important matters that are pivotal in choosing and accepting students. So we have classes for preparation. This is not part of our responsibility, but sometimes in order to succeed in works, we need to participate in what helps to pave the way for the success of such work. We help in TOEFL, SAT, guidance, and even in applying to schools and universities. So we have two kinds or two types of students that we help in the in grade 12, and they got a scholarship or those who were trying to study a language through being in the host country. We help them 
get accepted through our experience or through uh, the help of experiences from outside. So we help them get an acceptance from one of the uh, universities. We give them all the support they need, uh, language support, uh, follow-up uh, on uh, SAT and TOEFL, etc., and preparation in the 11th, 12th grade in order to have all it takes in terms of extracurricular activities. In addition to committee serv community service and all the preparations they need in order to get accepted. And so far, we are on the right track. Following on with the academic performance and giving uh, professional academic guidance, before talking about the employment of graduates, I need to talk about the well-being of the student. This is not our uh, task as a, a bureau, but as a student outside the uh, country, they need follow-up on all levels, especially psychological, etc. A lot of you heard about floods in Colorado. We have seven students there, so we called them all. Two of them were out of reach. So I called the uh, people who are there. I I asked about uh, Muhammad and Muhammad who are not there. They are not answering. So we called and called. They did not answer. Their uh, lines are off. Their parents do not know anything about them. One of them told me the one of the kids uh, is outside the country. He has something to do. And the other one, the, he was uh, his parents couldn't get in touch with him. So we uh, we couldn't sleep. Uh, we were thinking about him, especially that 500 people or more were missing. So I said, let's talk, uh, let's go and uh, look for them and get them. So at the end of the day, we were able to reach them, and uh, it was all because his battery had died. He didn't have a charger. It was really silly. So I gave them, oh, I sent them to uh, a hotel. You, there's an emergency situation, and you will be helped. So our follow-up is not only of academic nature, because the academic performance is a direct result of uh, the psychological well-being. Uh, so we give them everything, and we only ask them to take care of their studies. Uh, concerning the graduates, uh, our first graduate was in 2003. Abu Bakr called me. He told me, what will we do of these graduates? He, I said, this is our responsibility. And I said uh, to the scholarship, would you please add this as a new task? So we need to uh, hold an internship program. During the summer, we started building um, a database about governmental and semi-governmental institutions. We told them here, these are excellent graduates. Use them as interns. So we we tried, uh, on the basis, of course, of uh, majors, uh, to get them internships and jobs. And then we expanded this unit because we can have a lot of uh, research done. So the we, we always try to look for the best. In terms of benefits, we have $5,000. We have another program. Uh, it's a long story. I'm not going to be, I'm going to take long. So this is another project uh, also for other students. 
we cover all the um, tuition fees, uh, books, um, airplane tickets, insurance, health insurance, and 15% uh, of, uh, we give them 15% of their salary uh, if they get good grades. So we have, but we ask them to uh, do all they have to do, and not to miss any course, uh, to represent the UAE uh, very well, and uh, to always communicate with us. So if a student doesn't get in touch with us every two weeks, we call him, whether they are. Boys, girls, it doesn't matter as long as they are in touch with us. And thank God the technology is there now. You have no excuse. You can use your mobile, your Skype, emails. It doesn't matter unless there was a certain situation. Of course, they are excused, but they. this is a condition. They have at least to contact us. The, the through uh, phone calls, we have people in charge of the guidance. Each student has two persons that uh, do this job, and we are the only w country in the world who appoints two advisors to every student. So everything they need, we are there. And each advisor, academic advisor, has only three students, so they don't have any other job. They are uh, just dedicated to this job. They're, this is the day job. Uh, they have to prepare the study plans. Uh, they have to follow up with the students in terms of education and everything they need. So they need to get 3.0 as GPA. They need uh, to major uh, uh, and uh, to take into consideration the Abu Dhabi plan to 2030. And we also prepared a survey in order to know which are the best disciplines or majors they can get uh, into and they can benefit the labor market. And meet its needs. So we take the students and we ask them to choose among these majors. We do not take the decision. We just give them a list and they choose. Don't We tell them don't choose fashion design, history, geography. If you want to do that, stay here. But if you want to go outside and study something, you need to go and uh, choose a major that we can benefit from. Of course, uh, they they go to Harvard, Michigan University, MIT, Stanford University. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, doctor, for giving me this great uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for this uh, brief comment about the achievements and the jobs and uh, objectives. Now, in conclusion of this uh, conference, we will uh, be presenting the closing remarks by head uh, of the uh, by Dr. Abdullah. So I will be uh, I will be reading it. It is a great pleasure for me to conclude our fourth annual conference on the future of education in the UAE. So in the presence of academics and uh, panelists, I would like to thank you and uh, express to you our gratitude 
in the name of His Highness General Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces, and President of the ECSSR. This conference was organized under his patronage, and the objective was to achieve the vision of the UAE 2030. And it was chose by uh, His Highness General Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan and Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Maktoum, ruler of Dubai. And all of this in order to uh, to help our country become amongst the best countries in the world. So I would like, ladies and gentlemen, to express to you my greatest uh, thanks and appreciation for participating in this conference, all of you academics and participants, uh, for having presented your efforts, scientific efforts, scientific research. And uh, all of this is in the interest of the future and uh, the so uh, knowledge society in the UAE. And uh, thank you for participating in the four sessions uh, spent on two days. All of this uh, helped us crystallize many ideas and shed the light on many challenges and ideas. And I saw in you a lot of efforts deployed in order to focus on uh, the knowledge-based economy and research, investment in research, and prepare all the Emiratis for the labor market so they become the leaders of innovation and creativity in a future where the UAE can be in the forefront of uh, the uh, knowledge and education society and we can achieve our uh, human and uh, economic uh, visions, dear brothers and sisters, uh, or your discussions and outcomes and conclusions. All of these double our commitment and uh, our uh, our commitment to all the brothers and sisters that will give a lot to, to back to their country after they were they were able to benefit from the best infrastructure of scientific research and education in the world at the same time ladies and gentlemen i would like to tell you that i have great hope that your recommendations will be implemented scientifically amongst the government institutions in order to be able to cut the costs and make the path towards education easier and that the leadership and the good government governance will uh, benefit our dear country and will benefit all its uh, nationals and uh, the Arab people and all the peoples of the world. All of this embodies our values that we inherited from our fathers and uh, that we will keep uh, calling for forever. So I would like also Honorable Assembly to thank at the end this conference and the organizers of this conference and our partners, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Interior, the uh, ADNOC, Emirates Identity Authority, Ministry of Interior, Environment Agency Abu Dhabi, uh, Union National Bank, and Abu Dhabi Company for Onshore Oil Operations. Also, uh, the platinum sponsors Gulf News, United Arab Emirates, National Supreme Council, National Emergency Crisis and Disasters Management Authority, and the media partner, National Media Council. Uh, thank you and welcome. Come and may uh, you will always be successful and may the peace of God be upon you.